and everyone i'm sorry for slight delay uh, so um dr stephen moore at the department of mathematics uh, from the university of cape coast um, i'm going to talk today about um, machine learning for public health there are several aspects uh, of public health that uh, due to the increasing amount of uh, information that is coming in, especially clear cut is during the period of the pandemic, uh, there are a lot of things that um, this data that are this kind of information that we get in uh, can be very beneficial to our society in terms of making decisions. Um, so um, in the first uh, in this talk or in this model where we're going to treat machine learning for public health, um, I hope that at the end of the model, you'll be able to see some of the use cases and then you'll be able to at least have, a, have an idea of how to implement um, some models and how to go about them as well. Um, so this is just for the first part. Uh, so. I'm at the lecturer at the Department of Mathematics at the University of Cape Coast. Uh, there's some information about me there. So I'll talk today about what I'm going to talk about um, is neural network, machine learning, and deep learning. Then I'll try to talk about some of the different models and what the, these models really try to do or what these models are doing. And then these models are, are particularly we, we uh, emphasize on two of them, that is the supervised learning and then the unsupervised learning. And then finally, I'll talk about applications of, uh, of all that we've been talking about in, in the final part, if there is uh, more time left. Okay, so this is the schedule. Uh, initially, I planned that we do another schedule up to about five but I'm trying to look at the amount of uh, information and reducing it so that it fits clearly and you have a good understanding of the material and not an overload. So in the first part, as I said, I'll talk about machine learning, neural network, deep learning, then we'll take a break. And then I'll start about, I'll talk about the, say, the, the models, uh, the supervised learning methods, what is involved, and then uh, we'll have a lunch break. Then after the lunch break, I'll talk about the unsupervised learning uh, models as well. And then if there is time, uh, maybe I, I make a presentation of uh, something that we are doing here in respect to public health and machine learning as well, uh, that we are trying to develop a dashboard, uh, which is, can be useful for public health practitioners. So, I'm sure you've heard of uh, machine learning uh, in so many uh, ways, and you you consistently wondering what is what is machine learning, what is deep learning, what is neural network, what are the differences. Um, uh, what I'm going to do, uh, please, if you do not hear anything, try to draw my attention uh, so that I can um, try to draw my attention so I can be able to. Uh, describe or talk about it better. Well, so um, machine learning, uh, I'll start straightforward. Uh, these are some of the definitions that I got, uh, but I like this particular one from IBM. That is the branch of artificial intelligence and computer science, which focuses on the use of data and algorithms to imitate the way that humans learn and gradually improving its accuracy. So we know that machine learning is a branch of artificial intelligence. Uh, so the question is, what is, what is artificial intelligence? Uh, artificial intelligence, uh, by definition here, is the science and engineering of making intelligent machines, especially intelligent computer programs. Uh, it is related to a similar task of using computers to understand human intelligence but it does not have to confine itself to the methods that are biologically observable. Um, over the past couple of years, uh, due to technological advancements in storage spaces, processing powers, uh, we are able to have now enabled innovative products 
which are now relying on artificial machine learning. Um, and some of these things are like Netflix uh, recommendation engine, self-driving cars, um, it, Amazon as well uses uh, these kind of methodologies, recommendation systems. Uh, basically, uh, you can see these kind of systems. Uh, usually, I, I, when you go to the supermarket or when you go to a market where people are bargaining or traders are trying to sell you products, you see this kind of uh, things that we are implementing now happening in real life. And usually I give example as in when you, in Ghana, uh, when you go to the markets, uh, usually in the market you go, there are a lot of tables and chairs with people selling different products, beans, plantain, rice, and so many things. And then usually once you, once you go and then you buy something from one person, the another person just gives you, another person asks you uh, based on what you bought, uh, they try to find out or they try to somehow figure out what you are going to cook. And then in that sense, they, they make recommendations for you. So if you go to the market tomorrow and you ask that you want to buy beans, for instance, in Ghana, beans. Uh, the moment you talk to one market person asking that you want to buy beans, um, uh, the other people around or the market woman herself uh, will probably not be selling beans alone. She's selling other products. Then she tries to recommend to you some other products. So maybe she says, oh, what about rice? Uh, just, and I mean, when you are in Ghana, you know, beans and rice, a combination is usually going to make a, a, a very staple food called wache. So if you say no, then they, they go to what about plantain? Because there's another food where you need beans as a complement for. So this is exactly how uh, the whole idea of machine learning and deep learning is all about. Uh, if you go to Amazon or if you go to Netflix, let's take Amazon. If you go to Amazon and you buy uh, a product, immediately you get uh, you get immediately you get another uh, person asking you to if you or if you go to Amazon and you buy maybe a shirt uh, and a shoe, they. Then immediately you get some recommendations down there where they try to say people who bought this shirt and people who bought this shoe also bought belts, a socks, a tie, a suit. They try to make recommendations for you based on people who bought shoes and shirts. And this is exactly the whole concept of this machine learning, deep learning thing that is being deployed. Um, if you go to Netflix and you go and watch, uh, an action movie one time or two times. Uh, the next time you go to Netflix, you log into your account, immediately you see, you get recommendation. There's another action movie. There are other lot of action movies that you are being recommended to, that is being recommended for you to watch because uh, you seem to have given yourself a way that you like action movies. And this is exactly what the, the whole idea of artificial intelligence is trying to do and thankfully, because of the, the huge advancement in storage and processing power, computing power, we are able to do now a lot of things that we were not able to do uh, 10 years ago. And this is why it's becoming a very, very, very hot topic and a very, very um, interesting aspect as well. Uh, so uh, machine learning, um, uh, is an important component of the growing field of data science. As I said, one of the main things is data. And we use, through the use of some statistical methods, algorithms, we train algorithms that can make classifications or predictions that can uncover key insights into data mining projects. So if you present to the hospital, uh, if you give, um, if you go to the hospital and you give your, you give your, the doctor asks you several questions. Uh, are you having headache? Are you having vomit? Are you vomiting? Are you doing this? Uh, all that the doctor is trying to do is get gathering some data from you, and then you try to use this data then to make a prescribe or make a good differential diagnosis of the of the problem you probably presenting. And this is exactly what the machine learning also is about. That these machine learning algorithms are usually created uh, 
most nowadays most common frameworks that we use machine learning we use for machine learning is tensorflow and pytorch these two frameworks are some of the largely dependent uh, machine learning uh, frameworks so um then I'll, I'll also talk about machine learning, deep learning, and neural networks are all subfields of artificial intelligence. Uh, and then neural network is an, a subfield of machine learning, and deep learning is a subfield of the neural network. So I'll try to give you a good idea of this. So um, if you see the diagram on the, on the left, you see that there are three circles where I try to we try to explain uh, some basic information. So, for instance, a deep learning, uh, a deep learning, or we try to say what the artificial intelligence is the bigger set that contains all that you can think of: robotics, um, uh, image recognition, computer vision. And so many things. It contains a lot of uh, a wide class of uh, uh, stuff. So any program that can sense, reason, act, adapt, we call it an artificial intelligence. Machine learning, however, are algorithms whose performance improve as they are exposed to more and more data over time. So this is what machine learning is about. The more data you are giving, uh, the better. It is becoming, and then deep learning becomes a subfield or inside of a machine learning, uh, which is more of uh, how you arrange this kind of uh, network that I'll talk about uh, very soon. So deep machine learning, uh, in deep machine learning, you can use labeled data sets. And if you use labeled data sets, then it is a kind of supervised learning. That is what we call it. If you are using labeled data sets, uh, and this kind of informs or to inform its algorithm, but it does not necessarily require also some labeled data sets. So you can use labeled data sets, or you can also not use the decide to not use labeled data sets. If you use labeled data sets, we have it, we call it a supervised learning. And if you do not use, we call it another name, which I'll talk about again later. Uh, deep learning, for deep learning, we can ingest unstructured data. So some data are unstructured, some data are structured in this raw form. Uh, it can be a test, it can be an image, and it can automatically determine the set of features which distinguish uh, between categories of data from one another. And this eliminates uh, human intervention that is required uh, that uh, that is required and enable us to work in, uh, in in things that probably we have no idea of. So that is what the deep learning is about. That um, you don't need human intervention. You just throw in your data to your to your network, and then it gives you what you should look for, or it tries to tell you from all the data inputs that you are giving to your, your you are giving it. What it, what it is what it is what the data is telling you or what the data it probably is the information the data is giving you that maybe you are not considering and this is what the the whole idea of the deep learning is about okay so um just some pictorial uh, view or understanding so if you see um uh, on the bottom left uh, that's the green part. You see what um, a typical um, a typical neural network looks like. So a neural network, or what you do is put in some. You have some input data. It could be images. It could be data from patients. It could be data from your pharmacy. It could be data from your uh, students. It could be anything. But let's consider that that they are just data from patients presented to the hospital with some um, particular variables, maybe their age, their gender, um, their blood type, uh, their, I mean, whether they have uh, some type of infection or not, these are input data. So it could be whether they have tested for COVID, whether they have some COVID virus or mutation, whatever, these are all input data. Then you have hidden layers. So hidden layers, uh, I mean, 
by hidden layers called the hidden so these layers uh this is the input data here this is the hidden layer the output data so the input data is the data you have that you want to learn something from that you are not sure what you want to learn but you know that there is important data you want to see some trend and you cannot guess um this is the hidden layer these hidden layers of course you can see above uh, the left the left uh, the left above uh, you see in the in that one you see that there are so many hidden if i call it right so all these are hidden layers in this case okay if you look uh, right to the corner you can see that here we've labeled the layers layer one layer two hidden layer one hidden layer two hidden layer three so the the amount of hidden layers you have you can you can have as many as you want okay but for a simple neural network usually uh, you can have three hidden layers we usually will call that a very basic neural network a uh, very basic uh, we call it a basic uh, kind of machine learning deep learning technique something like this uh, so here if i take uh, let me call this the one let's take the one you see that we have this part as your input, and then we have the blue here at the end as your output. Then we have in between them some hidden layers. In figure one, we have one, two, three, four hidden layers. Okay, let me call the red one in the left bottom. As figure two. At figure two, okay. Figure two. So in figure two, you see we have also the same input, but now we have two hidden layers, and then we have outputs. Let me call then this figure here, figure three. In figure three, you see that we have also input layers. We have some input layer here. We have some hidden layers, and then we have an output. Then we have an output here. So this is actually how the architecture of uh, a neural network looks like. And then that goes on to uh, a deep learning as well. So the deep learning is basically based on, depending on the number of hidden layers you have and the depth of the hidden layers you have, then we we classify it as a as uh, we, we put it in this way of deep learning because then you have a lot of layers that you have to work that is going to work on anyway. So um, a, a typical example in Figure Four or in Figure Four, I present uh, what you should see uh, as the difference between a machine learning and a deep learning. So for a machine learning, you give it the inputs. And then you choose the features. You give it as well the features that you want, and then you leave it for classification and then also for output. So your input can be a car, but there are certain features of the car maybe that you, you are looking at. Then you give it as well for classification and output. So this is not necessarily a car. So, but in deep learning, you don't choose the features. You don't, you go away from these features and then you do what is, what we call, you give the input, then you create the layers, the hidden layers, and these hidden layers, they do the extraction, the feature extraction, and then they also do the classification and then it gives an output. So that is the, the main difference that the machine learning you have to select certain features you, you want to, you are targeting. You are targeting certain features that you want to use. But in the deep learning, you do not do anything of such sorts. You give as much as uh, you want, uh, you give all the data, and then you just go ahead to uh, allow the network itself to do this extraction for you. So those are, that's the main difference between a machine learning and a deep learning.
Okay, so I go on. Okay, good. Yeah. So um, we go on, and then here I talk about the, the classical machine learning. I think I've done some diagram explanation. Uh, which is more dependent on the human intervention to learn. And then the human aspects determines a set of features um, to understand the differences between the data inputs. So usually in this case, we require some structured data uh, for the learning process as well. Uh, what is a neural network or what is an artificial neural network? Uh, so artificial neural networks are comprised of nodes uh, in the, in my earlier diagram, if you could see, uh, they comprise of nodes. So they comprise of some nodes, layers containing an input layer, and then one or more hidden layers, and an output layer. So three important things that uh, that are required. One is the input. The other is the <clears throat> is the layer, the hidden layer, and then the other one is the output. So these are the three main components that is required of a neural network. So each node or artificial neuron connects to another and has an associated weight and threshold. Uh, if the output of any individual node is above a specified threshold value, that node is at activated and then sending data to the next layer of the network. Otherwise, no data is passed along to the next layer of the network by that node. So um, it works in such a way that if, um, so I talk about it uh, subsequently as well. So you have uh, these input layers, right? Then you have your hidden layers. Um, you have your hidden layers. These can be your hidden layers. And then you have some, uh, I'll say, some outputs. It doesn't necessarily have to be the same number of as the input. It can be more, it can be less, right? So then what you do basically, uh, if you want to um, create this kind of network, you see that there is a connection from all the inputs to the, the layers and then you create this uh, network in that way. And this is why it is always looking a bit like some cumbersome crazy stuff. And then there's a connection also for between the layers as well. Um, all the layers trying to connect themselves uh, just for feature extractions or classification. You do not know what really is uh, between them. Of course, there are many types of architectures in that sense. Um, and then the final part is that you have some outputs here as well in that sense. So this is how this whole um, artificial neural network um, looks in that sense of uh, artificial intelligence. And then, um, of course, uh, one other thing that uh, you, you realize we spoke about was the associated weight and threshold, which I will discuss again um, in subsequently. So we said, if the output of the individual node is above a specified threshold value, that node is activated and sending data to the next layer of the network. Otherwise, no data is passed to the next layer of the network by that node. Um, and then the deep, is deep learning is just referring to the number of layers in a neural network. So if you have more layers, then that is uh, what is making the, the uh, what we, what making us call this um, network a deep neural network. So if you have three layers, usually we will not call it a deep neural network, but the more layers you have, then the more, uh, the, 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 that is what we would call, if you have maybe more than three, we say this is a neural, a deep layer network. So we say that the neural network consisting of more than three layers and 
to be inclusive of the inputs and outputs can be considered a deep, right? We call it deep neural network. And then when it adjusts about three layers, we, we call them basic neural networks. So those are some of the of the main things that um, you should get. Uh, how machine learning works. So the machine learning uh, works in three steps. Uh, all the machine learning uh, works always in three steps. A decision process. The decision process is the algorithm, machine learning algorithms uh, are used to make a prediction or classification. Uh, so we use the algorithms to make prediction or classification. And then based on some input data, which can be labeled or unlabeled, labeled or unlabeled, we'll be able to produce an estimate about a pattern in the data, a decision process. Then the next is an error function. So this error function evaluates the prediction of the model. If there are known examples, an error function can make a comparison to assess the accuracy of this model. So that is the next, the other part, the error function. And then the final part is the model optimization process. If the model can fit better to the data points in the training sets, then weights are adjusted to reduce the discrepancy between the known example and, and then the model estimates. And then the algorithm will repeat this, evaluate and optimize process, updating weights and autonomously until a threshold of accuracy has been met. So this is uh, how machine learning works. In three processes, a decision process, an error function, and then a model optimization process, a model optimizer. Okay, so uh, next, I'll talk about machine learning methods. Uh, please try to let me know if I'm going too fast so I can slow down as well. Uh, uh, mute yourself. Okay. Okay, good. So, uh, machine learning methods, uh, supervised learning. One of them is supervised learning, as I said. So um, I just give you a brief, uh, a brief of uh, what these things are about. And then after the break, I take uh, one or two of these uh, models and then explain what uh, some of the uh, techniques that underline these models. And then uh, just for you to understand, but here I try to give a, a whole general overview of machine learning methods. Okay, there are many models. So one is supervised machine learning. The supervised machine learning is defined by its use of labeled data sets. It's defined by its use of labeled data sets to train algorithms to classify data or predict outcomes accurately. So supervised learning is using labeled data sets, train algorithms, classify data or predict outcomes appropriately. So you need train, you need labeled data sets, okay? So label data sets, if we say label data sets, it's, uh, example is uh, data from hospital, right? Uh, patient, every patient, every patient is giving um, some name, or every patient is giving uh, some uh, uh, an ID just for us to track, um, just for us to enable us to track uh, the patient. And then we, as input data is fed into the model, the model will adjust itself, uh, will adjust its weight until it has been fitted appropriately. And this occurs as part of cross validation, right? I'll talk about this as well, cross validation, to ensure that the model avoids overfitting or underfitting. Okay. So, so 
supervised learning also uh, some of the real uh, cases or use cases have been uh, to help organizations solve a variety of real world problems at scale, such as classifying spam. So usually what I tell my students is whenever you see an email, uh, you receive an email and you think it is not uh, you, something you want, you should, you should classify it as a spam. And then the more you do that, uh, then the better you are able to get rid of unnecessary emails coming to your inbox. That's a typical example. So in the same way of classifying spams in a separate folder from your inbox, this is what supervised learning is doing. So you are always giving an input. You must also make your contribution to make sure that you are doing the right thing. So supervised learning means uh, you get the data, you say this data belongs to category A, category B, category A, category B, category A, category B. Then the algorithm learns this uh, categorization you are giving. And then over time, it starts putting, those in, putting the data into those categories for you without you even necessarily going to again classify them again. So this is what the supervised learning is doing. Example is uh, spam classification, right? Um, when it comes to supervised learning, some methods um, uh, that are used uh, include or uh, include the neural networks is one of them. Uh, is the basic. We have the naive Bayesian method. We have linear regression. I'm sure you know linear regression. We have logistic regression. We have random forest, and we have support vector machines. So. Um, when we talk about, after the break, when we talk about supervised learning, I'll talk uh, on these um, kind of methods or these methods that uh, maybe not all, but some of them. And then for you to understand what these methods, the differences in these methods are and what they are doing in case of, uh, in, the, in the sense of uh, machine learning. Okay, so the next one, the next one that I'll talk about uh, for machine learning methods is the unsupervised learning. Okay, So for unsupervised learning, which is also known as unsupervised machine learning, we use machine learning algorithms to analyze and cluster unlabeled data sets. Okay, So unsupervised learning means you should try to relate unsupervised machine learning to unlabeled data sets. And what you do in this case is you use your algorithms to analyze and cluster unlabeled data sets. And these algorithms will discover hidden patterns or data groupings without the need of any human intervention. So all you do is throw in your data. You don't know what the data is about. It can be a mixture of hospital data, um, patient uh, bank data, a mixture of them. And then you'll be able to come. I think I pressed the mute button. Okay. Um, so, so, so um, unsupervised learning um, means you, should, you, you don't have, uh, you have an unlabeled data set. And these algorithms will discover the hidden patterns or data groupings, data groupings without the need for human intervention. So you have data, unlabeled data, don't know. Um, anyway, unlabeled data. What is really? What do we mean by unlabeled data? Maybe that's that's a good question. Uh, you may want to uh, ask. So unlabeled data. Let me write it here. Unlabeled data is a designation, a designation of uh, where we have pieces of data that have not been tagged with labels, identifying characteristics. So we have um, data, right? That is on task. Right, with the labels, identifying some characteristics, identifying characteristics, properties, properties, etc. Okay, which is typically what we what we need or most data are. So a typical an example is. Um, if you go to your field 
or let's say you take a human skin and you take a picture, maybe the person has some psoriasis or the person has some um, erythematosis or something, some skin condition, right? If you take that human, uh, that person's skin, so then usually what we do is we take a picture of the person's the skin where, we, the, where the condition is existing and then we label, we label it. So we take this picture and uh, let me do it for now. Uh, we take, uh, let me use, so we take a picture, so this is a picture, okay? And then in the picture, maybe the person has a condition. Conditions in the skin. Usually what we do that we say labeled data is that we'll probably look at it and say this is a fungal, a fungal infection. Now we say this one here is a fungal infection. And this one here is a bacterial infection. Let's get another color of bacterial infection. So we label the data in this sense, okay, in this sense of labeling. So this one here is a bacterial infection. This one here is a bacterial infection. So if we take 10,000 of such images, all those images, we label them. We label each one of them. We take, we look at the picture. We say this one here, bacteria here, fungal here. And this one here, maybe it's a virus. Let me just say, it's a virus. Okay, let me say D, uh, viral infection. So we label each, everything in the picture, we label it, okay? The part that is not there, we also say, uh, we, we, we just leave it for label there, that's fine. So this is usually how we do the labeling or annotation of data for use for machine learning work. Uh, what happens is that, for instance, if it is a, if it's a skin uh, pathology issue, we take a lot of these data sets and then we label all these parts that we see in the image. Anything that is related to the fungus or the bacteria or the virus, we label them. Then we use this as our training data set or training testing and validation. This is what we use for the machine learning project. Sometimes you have data that is unlabeled. Okay, unlabeled means that maybe you get this data, there's nothing really. So you don't know, you don't know if you get a data like this. Okay, if you get a data, such a data, you don't know if it is, um, if, uh, what, which one is which one, you don't know if this is a bacteria, this is a fungus, the virus, this is bacteria, this is the fungus. You don't know anything. You just know that somebody has given you an image, and then on the image, there are a lot of uh, you can see diseases in these images, and you can't you have no idea what this is telling you. This is what we call unlabeled data set, basically. There's no tag, no properties, no characteristics that is given. This is what we call unlabeled data set. And then what do we use? Uh, so um, the unsupervised method's ability to discover similarities and differences in information um, makes it ideal for exploratory data analysis, cross-selling strategies, customer segmentation, and image and pattern recognition. It's also used to reduce the number of features uh, in a model uh, through the process of dimensionality reduction. And by this, we do principal components analysis and singular value decomposition are two of the main approaches for dimensionality reduction. And other algorithms used in unsupervised learning include neural networks, k-mean clustering, and probabilistic uh, classroom methods. Yes, someone raised their hands. You can ask a question. Okay, good morning. Yeah, yeah go please. Ahead. I want to 
say this if I got you right with the supervised and unsupervised learning. So yeah. with the supervised learning, we realize the data set is labeled. So can you see yeah. that it is it is uh, one type of data? Like let's say you are taking hospital records. It is purely hospital records. And let's say it, from a, it will be from a particular department like the medical imaging. So all the records will be medical imaging related uh, data or records. Um, can we see that so that is labeled so data? So yeah, so if you go to medical imaging, uh, maybe department, uh, they take they take images. Um, it depends because you may have X-rays, you may have MRIs, uh, you may have um, some other type of images. Um, all these images you need to label them. So if you want to do your training, you expect that you use. Um, data from the uh, data sets from the same type of maybe uh, the, the same type of data set. If I if you get me correct, so it means if you go to maybe the medical imaging department, it means that uh, if you want to check for something, maybe you take X rays. Uh, you want to check maybe COVID and pneumonia. It's an example: COVID and pneumonia. So maybe you want to check COVID and pneumonia. So you take x-rays and you take these x-rays of patients uh, who have COVID and who have, or who have COVID or pneumonia or COVID and pneumonia, and then you label these data sets. It means that you have data set one, you say that you take the x-ray of the, of maybe of the spine, show the spine in the background, right? You have this guy, then you have, in the background here. And then you, you, you label this data set that, okay, when this patient came and we did this x-ray, we were able to determine that this was, what, what we saw was COVID. Another patient comes in and this guy here is there. Then you label this data set, maybe this is pneumonia, not COVID. So, all the data, you need to label them and you must decide what you want to do. You want, you don't need to label everything. You don't even sometimes, you don't need to label everything on the data. You don't need to say, uh, maybe uh, this guy, this part here. Of course, sometimes the person can have multiple diseases. In such a case, maybe a patient can come where the person has co-infection of both COVID and pneumonia. So you have to look at, okay, this person had both. Right. Uh, you, this is how some of these, some of the labeling is done. Some of the annotation of the data. This is how we do it. You take the, you take each day, each image to label it. This one is COVID. This one is pneumonia. When we did the scan, eventually this is the result. This one is both has both COVID and pneumonia. This one doesn't have. So this is a perfect uh, person. If the perfect person comes and we scan. This is how the lungs, or this is, how, this is how the lungs are looking. This is how the kidneys are looking. But this person came, we scan. Eventually, this person had COVID. This is how the lungs are looking. This is how the kidneys are looking. You label all of this. And then in the end, then in the end, what happens is that this becomes your labeled data set. Uh, so Adam, you can go ahead with your next question. So it doesn't oh, okay. have to be. It doesn't have to be necessarily from the same department. It could be ten or four uh, departments which are all taking X-rays of COVID pneumonia patients. You can go ahead okay. and collect all of them. It can be fifteen hospitals. You can go ahead to all the hospitals and try to collect all such images. We say we we call them. We say, do you have uh, data? Data on, uh, on X-rays taken from patients with COVID. Or take you from patients with um, with um, pneumonia. You want them. Then we gather all those ones, label them. Label them is now we give them names. We say this is pneumonia, this is COVID. This is this this has nothing to do with pneumonia and COVID. Then we throw this into the into the into the network or into the architecture, which is able to learn what it means to have COVID, what it means to have pneumonia. It just studies these images 
And then finally, it's able to extract certain important features that it is able to use to distinguish between pneumonia and COVID, for example. So the next time you give it an image of a COVID patient, it will be able to tell you with some level of accuracy that this is a COVID patient. If you give it a pneumonia patient, it is able to tell you with a certain level of accuracy that this is a pneumonia patient. Please, is it clear? Yes, please. It is it, clear. So okay. the next thing I may ask is using supervised and unsupervised learning, which which yeah. one may give a good uh, let's say you want to do a prediction, which which one of these will give a good uh, or will, will yeah will be able to give a good prediction? Yeah, so I mean as 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 I said, these are all methods. Right. So if depending on the type of data sets you have, you are very restricted or you are very limited on what you can do. So if you have a data set where, for instance, you have labeled all your data sets, COVID, COVID, pneumonia, COVID, pneumonia, you, you don't have to waste your time going to do an unsupervised learning method because unsupervised learning, as I say, as the name goes, needs unlabeled data. So if you have some maybe in some cases you get some data where some of the things are not labeled or a chunk of the data is unlabeled. Then you can decide that, okay, maybe I use an unlabeled data set and I throw away all the ones which are labeled. Then in that case, you go purposely for unlabeled data sets and then you go for unlabeled supervised or unsupervised learning and you use unsupervised learning techniques. Of course, it will, I'll tell, Again, in the end, uh, you when I give again the next lectures on supervised learning or supervised learning, you'll be able to appreciate uh, the, the differences uh, in these methods as well. But in general, if you have labeled data sets, go for supervised learning. If you have unlabeled data sets, go for unlabeled or unsupervised learning. Uh, on supervised learning, the method itself discovers uh, similarities and differences in information. So. You throw all the information, the data in there is unlabeled. Then the method itself learns the whole data and tries to find the differences in the data and classifies them on its own. So you say it will do the classification on its own. It will try to push the data in different clusters, uh, try to make sure that, okay, data sets that have, similar, that have certain properties, characteristics, I put them in this class, this one too, they have similar properties. I put them in this, like it does that on its own. Um, this is what we call. So uh, it's, it discovers similarities and different information. It makes it ideal for exploratory data analysis. So if you have data, you do not know what is in there. You can just throw it into the supervised learning to explore what can be found. What can I find from this data? What is, what is that? Maybe some information is there, I don't know. What can I find this? Can it give me this information? So exploratory data analysis, cross-selling strategies, customer segmentation, and image and pattern recognition. So uh, maybe um, you, if, if, for instance, you, there's an outbreak of a disease, you do not know. Maybe it's not an outbreak. Maybe it's an outbreak. But patients come into the hospital. If we have machine learning implemented in some uh, public health system in the hospital, once you start, once you start getting patients, it starts uh, it starts looking out for is there a possible outbreak? Is there a possible outbreak? And then once it sees a certain patterns or trends, it tells you immediately that there is a possible outbreak from a certain region or a certain district or a certain community. And this is, will help you and uh, which will help public health sector or public health decision making because then they can immediately go to such a place to start um, quarantining or start addressing um, uh, whatever the problem might be in that area. So it's also used to reduce the number of features. So sometimes you have huge amounts of features uh, in the model, and then you, you have to reduce the features and still maintain the most relevant features that are needed for your model. And this is what also supervi unsupervised learning does. So, I'm sure you know principal component analysis or singular value decomposition. These are two main methods. Of course, there are many other methods like uh, domain mode decomposition 
and so and so on and so forth, or maybe physics informed as well. But these are all things that uh, we can talk about. We will talk about uh, maybe over time. The other algorithm is learning, including network, gaming clustering, probabilistic clustering methods as well. So another one, machine learning methods is the semi-supervised learning. Um, anybody else has a question? Y yes, I have a question. Please go ahead. Yeah, I, I just wanted to find out, is the, when you talk of labeled the data set, is it the same as the uh, coded data set or is it just the terminologies that are different? Uh, hello, sir. Uh, I, I don't. I, um, can you hear me? Yes, please. Oh. I can get you now. Uh, okay. Uh, please ask your question again. Yes, I, I was saying is when when you when you talk of labeled data set, is it the same as the coded data set? Um, coded data set. So sometimes what happens is that um, we have um, a data set. And then we give it, um, um, I think this is, this, is, this is the same, basically. The basic understanding is the same. So you, you give the data set some codes, and this is exactly what we call the, the, the labeling of the data set. Unless I'm, I'm mistaken. Uh, sorry, sorry, to... sorry, Doc. Yeah, I'm listening. Are they? Right. Um, from my understanding, what what you, you were saying, uh, when we when we say that the data set is labeled, um, uh, I don't know if this is what I got. Uh, we are saying if it is um, um, a, a cancer, uh, if it is a malignant cancer, we can identify yeah. that this type of information shows us uh, that this is a malignant cancer. Then exactly. this type of information. Uh, it, it, different tests that have been done can actually sh show us that it's a, it's a benign one, right? Exactly. So we are able exactly. to then say, if the model that we are training is given new data uh, from the training that we have done or the information we have given it to say yeah. this is malignant and this is none, it is then able yeah. to separate between the two to say, okay, Correct. with this new data set, which may not necessarily have information about whether it is malignant or, or uh, uh, benign. benign. We can then say, yes, we can then say, this is malignant and this is not. So I understand labeling as telling the machine or the, 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 the model, what is the difference between the data sets? Whereas with coding, I don't know, yeah, probably we are indicating the different codes. Uh, it may be different because we have got uh, different tuples that may communicate different things, but that, that, that are characteristics of the same data. So yes, yes and no, uh, from, from my understanding about uh, coded data, uh, we can code our data uh, from being, um, what do we call it, uh, categorical, and we, 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 we code it so that we have got the, the, uh, the, the coding within that system. I don't know if I pick the coded data set uh, according to how it is explained here. Yeah, I think this is a very good explanation. Uh, this is a very good. So um, I think uh, who asked the question on the coded data set? William, right? Yes, Doc, it's me. So wh what is your understanding of the coded data set? <clears throat> I think from the way you explained it, that's how I do understand. It's okay, like you're just, you're, just give, you're just giving direction that this data I want it, if you, if you say the outcome, you say this one, I want it to be, to be an outcome variable. This one is maybe the dependent variable, independent variable. Then you label uh -huh. them according to that, then you are able to get what you are supposed to get. Yeah, okay. 
So I think it's, it's a yes and no situation as he has explained, that's correct. All right, sir, thank you very much. Okay. So the other one, uh, other learning is the supervised, semi-supervised learning. Um, so just for maybe if someone is lost, um, I can draw again. So if you have an image, where you have made a picture where you have this image in the background, then you have some other things hiding here. Then you do the labeling. So you say maybe this is benign cancer, right? And then you say, okay, this one is uh, some other type of cancer. So if you give this as data, right? If this is your data for your model, okay? If you give this to your model, then it's able to in output, um, it will give you an output, maybe showing you uh, where it's benign, it has, it will circle it for you. So I'll show you an example, hopefully after the break. And then in that sense, you're able to know um, exactly what you are doing. But sometimes you have a data, you have, uh, you don't have any labeling of the data and you do not know what uh, also to do because you do not know, you have no idea about it. In that case, then you do a non-supervised learning where it tries to find out the features on its own. But we also have semi-supervised learning. So semi-supervised learning offers a happy medium between supervised and unsupervised. You can see as, as I was talking about, because sometimes you have some data which is unlabeled, some data which is labeled. And during the training, it uses a smaller labeled data set to guide classification and feature extraction from a larger unlabeled data set. So if you have a situation where you have a, a, mixed, a mixed data set where there's huge, a huge amount of unlabeled data set, but some amount of labeled data sets, maybe you can use that small amount of data set that you have, which is labeled, to guide the feature uh, selection, the feature extraction, and as well as the classification as well you know, from the unlabeled set as well. And then you can use it to solve problems when we do not have enough labeled data sets. Okay, as I explained, when you do not have en enough labeled data sets, semi-supervised learning is always a good place, uh, a good method to, to discuss or to, to talk about. Okay. Uh, okay. So, okay, so um, I think I didn't put any pictures uh, to explain, but uh, maybe I do that for you after the break, uh, where I go into details of uh, supervised and unsupervised learning uh, after the break. So another type of learning uh, is what we call the reinforcement machine learning. So reinforcement machine learning is uh, also a machine learning similar to the supervised learning, but algorithm isn't trained using data. We have no data and then we go for reinforcement learning. The model learns as it goes by using a try and error um, technique. It uses a sequence of successful outcomes, and then it will be reinforced to develop the best recommendation or policy for a given problem. For example, IBM has a system that, that won the a recent contest uh, in 20, 2011, but it's not the only one. There, there are also the... Um, the AlphaGo, okay, there's the AlphaGo, also which one, uh, the chess, the chess, uh, which one, the chess game, 
some of these are all reinforcement learning. They do not, they, they, they learn based on rewards and feedback. As you give it feedback, then it reinforces the, what it is learning. So you can say, okay, if it goes through, if it, if it does the right thing, I give it a yes. If it does the wrong thing, I give it a no. Then as it learns like that, if, as you keep giving it yes and yes, it knows that, okay, this is how, where the, where the direction is supposed to go. So this is like reinforcement learning. Learning where we are using a trial and error process. And then um, reinforcing this based on some recommendation that we give. Uh, this is what uh, we call the reinforcement learning. And this is very popular in gaming. Uh, what very popular uh, machine learning technique that you use a lot of games, uh, development uh, and driving of cars and so on like that. So based on the outcome, it goes all right. Uh, it gives some results and it uses this to keep rewarding as well. Okay, so next one is, I try to show you now the, the, these models that I've discussed. Um, one is the data with labels. That is supervised learning. So you put, you give your input, you have some supervised learning um, machinery, then it gives you an output, some maps. Then you have unsupervised learning where you have data without labels, unlabeled data sets. You, you have some inputs, you go through some unsupervised learning, and then it gives you some outputs. And then you use this output. So these outputs are usually classified. So it could be clusters or some other type of output as well. Then the last one, which I spoke about was the reinforcement learning. So the reinforcement learning, in that case, you have some states and actions. So what you do is you put in some states and actions, you put in your input data or your input states and actions, and then you tell it that whenever you do the right thing, I give you a reward for that. And then this reward reinforces the learning that is supposed to happen. And it, when you keep going, it keeps getting better. The more, the more data, the more rewards you are giving, the more it knows that it is learning the right thing. I mean, it's the reinforcement learning is what we call like how to train a baby or how to train a child. You when, when the child goes wrong, you say it is wrong. This is what the right thing is. Then it learns the right thing. Whenever it does the right thing, or how to train a dog. If you have a dog, when it does the right thing, you give it a, you give it a bone. When it does the right thing, you give it a bone. It consistently tries to do the right things so that you give it a bone. And then it learns that, okay, whenever I want the, whenever I want the bone, I do the right thing. So this is the reinforcement learning technique as well. Okay, so with this, I'll end the first part. Uh, we'll take a break. And then after when we come back, uh, we'll continue from, from there. But, uh, and then where, where now, I'll now go into supervised learning. We'll discuss supervised learning. And then we'll go for lunch. And when we come back, I talk about our supervised learning. And then we, did, we have a break. And then when there's more time, I, I make a presentation of some work that we are doing here, combining mathematics and some of these techniques that we are using as well. When we do not have data, we can use mathematics to create data, mathematical models to create the data, and then use this data to do a supervised learning as well. So all the best, and then we, we meet again in the next session. Thank you very much, Doc. Okay, are there any questions, please? If there are questions, maybe you can ask them and then I'll, ask, I'll try to answer them. Okay. Hello, Doc. Yeah. Yes. So with this diagram uh, you have projected now, yeah, yeah, with the unsupervised learning, I realize you don't have the error and then the critique uh, sessions here so I, I want to find out if that uh, with the unsupervised learning that uh, 
process is 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 not needed in the error and then the critique as we have with the supervised and the, the reinforcement learning. Yeah, we don't have that. We don't have this in the unsupervised learning. And I'll explain details uh, when we go into unsupervised learning, why this is so. Okay, please, thank you. Okay, and then someone also asked, Imaria asked, how huge can the data be to be utilized in machine learning and deep learning? This is very good. I mean, how huge can you, your data be? So, um, uh, usually I say that whenever you, um, or the, the, the usual, the basic notion is, whenever you are doing the machine learning, you're always going to have some for training, some for validation and some for testing. So you must have, um, if you have 100 data sets, it's, it's too small uh, to really learn some big features. Um, but let me just say maybe 500 data sets to 1,000 data, data sets is already good enough for very good models. Okay, so... Okay, Gwendolyn asks for a visual example who will be better. Okay, yes, and I, I, as I said, I will try to do this in the next session. Please, I want to ask just a brief one before the break. Uh, how do we really apply? Okay, except you come to that. Uh, given a scenario where someone is um, um handling uh, data from the clinic and from the hospital, retrospective data, data from clinical records. And then he wants to model some diseases and and the uh, outcomes using machine learning techniques. Yes. Uh, there are particular processes that have that are special or that are tailored down to uh, the medical uh, data. Hello, I are, are you talking? Yes, I did. You get my question, sir? You said there are what? I said, are there, are there specific uh, machine learning algorithms that are tailored to uh, clinical data, public health data? Um, so this is what I this is what I, I, um, I said. Um, that one is, for instance, um, uh, for instance, there is the COVID, COVID, data, COVID data or malaria data, right? or there is pneumonia and uh, other ones. So all these data that are there, what happens is that um, you can use this data set. Let me see if I can, uh, let me see if I can go beyond and then maybe try to show you an example of uh, maybe um, COVID and pneumonia project that we did here. So if you have data sets in the public domain, this could be um, data set related to malaria. Uh, if you have such data sets, you can already use it for um, such projects or such problems like this. that I did. I hope my screen uh, comes on. Okay, good. So I'll share my screen briefly for you to see some of the stuff. Um, so for instance, um, in this project, what we, what we did um, together with some colleagues, trying to find uh, COVID, uh, and then pneumonia cases of x-rays that are presented, right? So we label the data set. You can see the labels. You can see here, there's label here. You can see we label the data set. If it is label is zero, then it's a normal, it's a normal human being, right? It's a normal person, doesn't have COVID, doesn't have pneumonia. So we say label zero. I hope you are watching. 
label zero. If it is a normal, if it's normal, then we say it's label zero. If it is label one, then we say that this is a, COVID, this is a pneumonia patient. This is someone who has pneumonia. And then we say it is label two. Unfortunately, there's not label two here. And let me see if I have any, another image with uh, COVID. Then we say label two if the patient has COVID, for instance. So in that sense, what happens is that we label we we label the data set. So this is we take this from hospital. Hospital that gives us these X-rays and say, oh, these X-rays are patients without COVID without pneumonia. And then this one it says this one has pneumonia, so we label it. This is a pneumonia. This this picture is a pneumonia patient. This picture is a normal patient. This is a normal patient. This is a normal patient. This is a pneumonia patient. This is a pneumonia patient. Then we have other pictures which are showing COVID patients uh, as well. So we label the data set. So this is what we mean by the labeling. Then now we go and create our, our deep learning method. So now this is supervised. So we then go and create our, our method and then we put some data to it and say, okay, now you have learned what a COVID, a COVID uh, picture looks like, what a pneumonia picture looks like, what a normal picture looks like. So we give you some pictures. Can you tell us whether these pictures are pneumonia, COVID or normal? So this is the, this one, this one here, we give these pictures to the model and then the model is able to predict say, okay, give me this one, uh, these pictures that you have given to me, this is pneumonia, this is pneumonia, this is pneumonia, this is a normal one, this is a pneumonia one, this is a normal one, this is a pneumonia. So it's able to tell uh, every picture we give, we, we're giving us an input, it is immediately able to tell whether it's a pneumonia, uh, a pneumonia patient, a COVID patient, or a normal patient. And this is how we do this labeling. So then from there, we put in many pictures that is able to then precisely tell pneumonia and non-pneumonia cases for us without even the, the medical sonographer or whatever, radiologist, anything telling us. We'll be able to tell, uh, the model will tell immediately between the, the differences between them. Sir, is the prediction 100%? So for medical cases, it's very important. You must get a prediction accuracy of ninety-nine uh, point, maybe at 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 worst ninety-nine point nine for a med for medical cases. Because if you do get ninety-nine percent, then you know that for every hundred patients, you are predicting one wrong. That's one percent. So if you do one million, you you are doing one percent wrong prediction, and this is death. So for medical uh, applications, you must almost get uh, zero point zero one error in your application. This is very important. Okay. Any questions? All right, so if there are no questions, then I say that we continue uh, in 30 minutes. All right, so sorry for the lateness. Um, so as I said, uh, in this case, uh, what, I'll do to, what I'll do in this session is I'll talk about supervised learning. Then I will also, uh, then make a quick presentation of uh, some example of uh, some work that we are doing here um, on a different slide as well, but it will be very brief for you to see some of the things that we are um, talking about in this case. So supervised learning, um, as I said, uh, is one of the simplest learning methods uh, where we actually, we are using data. And then what we do is that we, it entails, we create a function 
that can be trained by using a data set and then applying this data set to unseen data to meet some uh, predictive performance. So the goal in the supervised learning is usually uh, is to build a function that will be able to generalize over data that it has never seen. So you give it labeled data, you build your function that learns the data, and then um, it's able to then predict um, other types of data in similar manner that it has never yet seen before. Um, it's usually grouped into two phases. Uh, in the first phase, you segment the data into two types, uh, the, the training data and the test data. Both the training and then the test data contains test vector, which is what we call the input vector, and then some unknown or desired output. So we make an input and then we try, we give it a desired output and then we allow it to go through this um, uh, learning uh, phase uh, of, of the data, the training of the data as well. Okay, so uh, in that case, what you do is you train the function. Um, so if I have to give an example, what I mean is that you have a vector of inputs. You have a vector of inputs here. Uh, no, maybe I, I should use a blue color. Uh, you have a vector of inputs for inputs. So this is inputs. Then you have some hidden layers here. So let's call some hidden layers inside. And then you have some outputs. Okay, let's just say you have some outputs. So you train the mapping function uh, with the training data set until it meets some level of performance. And by level of performance, we mean that we give it a metric. Okay, so there are metrics that we use in this sense to tell if the level of performance is good or is not good. That helps us to learn or know the, how the mapping function, okay? That helps us to know how this mapping function behaves. Uh, so this is related to the metric, and there are many types of these metrics um, that I'll talk about in the in the latter part. So um, in the context of supervised learning, this occurs with each training sample where you see you use the error, okay? The error, that is the actual versus the desired output to alter the mapping function. So it kind of use an error to check uh, how close the actual is of the desired, and then less consistently this error by trying to reduce this error until this until we get the desired output, okay, that we want. Um, in the next phase, what it does is that you then test the trained mapping function, okay. So uh, if you if you if you listen earlier on what I said was uh, you do it as a training and testing, okay? So first phase is training. You train your, you, and this is what we mean, this is the first phase, uh, you start from here. You train the mapping function with the data sets until it meets a level of performance. And then this occurs with each training sample. So you give it training sample after training sample after training sample, and then you use the error that you are using to then go and alter your mapping function. Right? So you have a function here, then you train and then check the error, and then you try to alter the mapping function in a way that it is now able to give you the desired results. The next phase is then to test, to test this mapping function, the trained mapping function, right? You test the trained mapping function against a test data set. Right, so your data set, you split it into a training data set and then a testing data set. So you do the training here, where then you train this mapping function. Then the next phase is, this is phase two, phase two, which is then now to, to use the test data. So in the test, using the test data means you test the trained function on your data set, on this new data set. The test data set represents the data that has not been used for your training. 
and provides a good measure of for how well the mapping function generalizes to unseen data. So this is a simple illustration of uh, how this whole thing works. You have your input, you have your input, this is the input data, labeled data. You have this labeled data there. What you do is that you put this data into two. One and two. One is what you call, you call one, Call this one training data set, and then you call this part the test data set. So usually, sometimes there's a percentage that people try to use. Sometimes, uh, if you have a data, some people want to do a seventy uh, by thirty, right? For test uh, for training and testing, they use a seventy percent of the data for testing. They use a thirty percent uh, for training, sorry, and they use a thirty percent for testing, for testing. So this is what sometimes some people do. Or sometimes others also decide to use an 80% by 20%. So um, you, you need to split it in a good uh, proportion. Of course, I'll talk about it again later. So you have your input vector, your input data, then you give it a desired output. This is the desired. Okay, so you tell it what you expect or what you want from this data. So this becomes your desired output, the targeted output, you can call it. Then what happens? You have your input, your data, you have a desired output, then you build your network, your network architecture. So this is where you build your, your, your network or your, your algorithm in the mapping function. So this mapping function is basically going to take your input data, go through the mapping function, check it against some error measures, error, uh, error measures that it gives, a certain threshold. If it performs in this threshold, then it is good. Then the mapping function is a good function for us on this training data set. Once we are, we are certain that this training data set, we use it on this mapping and we get the desired out the desired map. Then we give this, we use the test, the test data set. Now, now we use the test data set. We use this test data set. We use this test data set now to test the mapping function that we have developed, right? So the training data set to create the, a good mapping function, right? You use it to create a good mapping function. Then you use the testing data set, right? To test The correctness, uh, let me use this word, correctness of the mapping function, right? Of the mapping function. So you have a training data set, you have a testing data set, you split it and in the percentage, then you use one to train to get the function, and then you use the testing one now to test the function that you have created. And this is what uh, involves uh, the main procedure um, in this idea of the supervised learning. There are many uh, algorithms that exist under the supervised learning. We'll talk about some of them briefly. Um, neural networks, decision trees, supports vectors machines and naive Bayesians, uh, naive Bayesians methods as well. Um, so, yes, Adam, please talk. Okay, thank you, Doc. Please. Before we went for the break, yeah, I think somebody asked what the uh, the case load, like the number of uh, cases or the data you, the size of the data you need for your machine learning to do the prediction, yeah. and you indicated five hundred to thousand. 
is ideal or is okay. So with the data, uh, the test data and then the training data, if let's say you have a data set of 500 variables that yeah. you want to use for your, for your supervised learning. Yes, in, the, in this case, are you going to, uh, let me say, apportion it the 70 or 30 percentage wise to use for your training and data set, or you should just use the only the 500 to, to do the training uh, as the training data. I don't know, I want to get uh, this clear. Uh, so, Adam, you're asking about the size of the data. Yes, please. So, okay, maybe in the in the first part, I was a bit too uh, general about it. Um, so, the, the rule of thumb is that if, for instance, you are looking for, um, you want uh, 15, right, um, annotates. If, for instance, you, you, you are looking for 15 features, right, from your data, the rule of thumb, the rule of thumb usually means that you should have at least 10 times more rules as features. In this sense, um, we are talking about if you have a data set, right, like this. This is your data set. And this is your feature one, feature two, up to about 15, right? By features, I mean, um, it may be a patient. Let's do a patient. Patient one. Feature one is gender, right? So let me say male, blood type. Uh, sorry, I was almost going to say O positive. Blood type AA, right? Um, genotype may be O positive, and so on and so on. Right, some some particular information there uh, may be uh, temperature, uh, thirty six degrees, um, color of the palm, uh, looking reddish, and so on. These are all uh, patients' data, but they are all characteristics, right? If you want to say, okay, this is this is the malaria data set. Let's say this is the malaria data set. This is the malaria data set that a patient comes, you think about uh, 15 uh, information, vital information from the patient. Then now you want, to, you want to develop a model that will use only five, let's say only five of these features to determine a malaria case, right? So for five features, for five features, the rule of thumb says you should consider a data set of at least 10 times rows, right? You should consider a data set of maybe um, 10 times at least, okay, at least 10 times as many rows in your data set, as many rows or data points, right? As the features as the features. So it means that if you have 15, 15 columns, I think that maybe you'll be looking for 150 rows, at least, at least, right? So in that sense, if you want to do your splitting, then you want to do your training set, 70% or let me say 80% of the data sets and then your testing sets, 20% of the data sets. Adam, is it, is it okay? Yes, please. Yeah, so if you are not looking for a lot of features, you really, some the, the rule of thumb is that you don't need a huge amount of data sets. If you are looking for just some one or two, three features. You don't need a, a huge amount of data set. But if you are looking for more features, then you need huge data sets. 
And usually the rule of what we say is the more data sets you have, the better you are able to create a, a good model in that sense. Okay, any other question before I go on? Any other question? All right, so I'll go on then. Um, okay, so okay, someone is asking that I repeat uh, the information on this one. <clears throat> so, uh, so example. Um, how do you split the data? This is the question that we are uh, we're trying to answer. That you can split your data into a certain percentage uh, for training and then testing. For training, you can say 80%, you're testing 20%. But what is really a good amount of data? What is a good, uh, what, what, how good or how huge should the data be to be able to use it for your training or your learning or your all these things? And what I'm saying is that if you have a data, so usually if you get a patient, let's say a patient comes to the hospital, you take the gender, you take the blood group, the blood type, the genotype, you take the temperature, you take maybe eye color, you take stool, and then you take some, whether they have some um, um, gram negatives, gram positives, uh, you also check if they, they have some other features. You, you check, you are trying to just, Check maybe are they anemic? What is the hemoglobin look uh, level like? Uh, all these things you take all this data from the patient, his temperature, red blood cells counts, uh, gram positive, gram negative. Does he have all these things? You 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 just do this test on the patient. You have this information. Patient one. What we are saying is, for instance, if it's the malaria. Patients maybe finally, finally the medical doctor makes a prescription and says patient has malaria, right? Patient has malaria. Another patient come, patient two. They take all the vitals, male, uh, AS, um, temperature 33, everything. Patients, no malaria, right? So we are creating a malaria data set. Patient three comes. We take all the same vital information, malaria. So this is labeling. We are already labeling the, the patients, the right when we took the vitals and what we the prescription, the diagnosis we gave, and it was correct. In that sense, we, we do for all so many patients. We do for so many patients. We do for so many patients, okay? If you do for so many patients, then the rule of thumb is, okay, maybe you now want to, now that you have this data, you want to find out if you can create a net, uh, a neural network, or you can create a machine learning function that will be able to take only five characteristics, only five of these data points, only five of these features, maybe the gender, the blood group, the temperature, uh, something else, uh, hemoglobin level, uh, gram positive or gram negative. You, you want these features to determine if the we can use these features to find out if the patient has malaria or not. So you have restricted the features you want. Once you do that, then what happens is that you have just five features. The rule of thumb says that if you have only five, if you want only five features from such a data, you just need about 50, 50 patients. Data record from about 50 patients is enough to do such a training. So this is the rule of thumb uh, that we, I'm, I'm talking about on what is the size of data that you need, okay? Um, someone is asking, what if I do 20% for training and test and testing for 80%? So um, if you do, if you are doing, um, if you want to do, 
use less of your data for, for training. Um, so the, the, the thing is, the thing is about the, this machine learning is you want to create a function that is able to predict. You do not, that is able to predict some amount of, um, that, it's, uh, that is able to predict accurately some input data. You do not want to use the, a little amount of your data to try to train a, a mapping function. And then rather try to use a huge amount of your data to do the testing. Because the testing, as the name says, is just to test the correctness of your model. So if you use small amounts of data to, to create a model, you don't, you don't use a huge amount of data then to do a testing of, of this model. You always do that. You always use more data to develop your function and use less data for accuracy. Next slide. So here, as I said, there are many uh, supervised, uh, supervised uh, machine learning. And one of them is linear regression. So very common, very easily known. Yes, Adam, go ahead. Okay, thank you. So that means if you are not looking out for, uh, let me say a lot of features, then that means your data for the training set will be small, or you can have it in small uh, a smaller number, like the fifty yes. that you mentioned. Yes, if you, are only when for, if you are not looking for um, a lot of features, you can always use small amount of data set. Because I, anyway, if you are not looking for a, a huge amount of features, you see as I go on, I talk about regression, uh, linear regression and stuff. You see that. Uh, if you are not using a huge, you are not looking for huge uh, features, then very easy stuff in mathematics, uh, in uh, known in statistics, is even enough. Please, are you online? Are you asking questions? Yeah, I'm, I'm. I'm. I'm okay. I'm giving a thumbs up. Ah, okay, that's fine. So. What is linear regression? I'm sure from statistics, we all know, uh, or I mean, I will not assume you all know, but linear regression, uh, without assuming anybody knows, is a method of modeling a target value based on independent predictors. It is used mostly uh, for forecasting and finding out cause and effect relationship between variables. So regression techniques usually differ based on the number of independent variables and the type of relationship between the variables and independent, independent and dependent variables. So linear regression, as I said, is for forecasting, right? For forecasting and finding out costs and effects of relationship between variables, independent and dependent variables. So a simple case, a simple linear regression is that uh, you have a type of regression analysis where the number of independent variables is one, and then there, there is, oh. and then, and then there is a linear relationship, as the name suggests, uh, between the independent variable x and then the dependent variable y. So. If you have such a data on the, in the picture to, to my left or to your left of the screen, you see that if you have a data where the blue points are the data points, then we say that we can fit, we can do a line of best fits, okay? That fits this data linearly. Just that, mean, that means that we can draw a, a line through this data such that the errors, the, uh, the points or the difference from the points, okay? Um, so, so we can do this like that, the, 
the difference from this line to this line, the error difference is very small, or it's almost the same. So we call them, we say that this is a line of best fit because it reduces the error amongst all the data points. And usually, uh, we, what we do, we write it as data, and this is a predicted, find the square of that thing for the number of data points that we call. And then we call this the function. So basically, this is like a least squares method technique that you can even use. So based on your given data points, you can draw, you can create a simple linear regression in this sense. And then I tried, I tried to um, uh, make some uh, example of how you can do some, something like this in Python and then write your own code uh, that will be able to do a linear regression for you. So, and then you can import some NumPy and do some more. You know, anyway, so the next one is logistic regression. So linear regression, as you saw from the name, simple a linear regression. So this is a linear regression. Of course, um, it, 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 it can also be other types of um, regression, not necessarily a straight line, it can be a quadratic one, right? So if you if you have, you can also have a case so in the linear regression A plus Bx, but we can also have, or let me write A1. We have A0, A1. So here we can have A0, A1x, A2x squared. We can have, a0, A1x, A2x squared, A3x cubed, and so on and so forth, right? To generalize it to a polynomial function, Sn, n from 0 to, to n, something like that. And when we do that, based on how the data looks like, we can always find some fit uh, for our data. If, if the data is curve like that, we can develop a function that will try to fit it in that sense. So, but I start with just a simple linear regression so you understand what the independent variables are and then the dependent variables are. So your independent variables are X and then your dependent variable is Y, your output and your input. Okay. Next, we talk of logistic regression. So logistic regression is, is very famous uh, in a, one of the famous um, machine learning algorithms after linear regression. Um, it is similar to linear regression, but not the same use. The, you use. the biggest difference is that is what they are used for, right? And the linear regressions are used for predicting and forecasting the values. But logistic regression is used for classification. We use it to classify um, things. And then there are many classification tasks that we do routinely, um, classifying whether an email is a spam or not, classifying whether a tumor is malignant or benign, classifying whether a website is fraudulent or not, classifying whether someone is dead or alive. These are all classification problems. So in that sense, you use logistic regression in that sense of classification. Of course, one of the names that usually um, people also call this is what we call the sigmoid function. Okay? Sigmoid function or logistic regression. That's how we call it. So the logistic regression or sigmoid function, the logistic regression algorithm uses a linear equation with independent predictors to predict a value. The predicted value can be anywhere between negative infinity to positive infinity. We need the output of the algorithm to be class variable 
it says yes for one, zero for no, yes, zero for uh, uh, for dead, one for alive, uh, yes for zero for black, one for white. And so therefore we are squashing the output of the linear equation into a range of zero and one. And so the predicted values between zero and one, we use the sigmoid function. Um, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure if I, I have an example of a sigmoid function. Ah, okay. At least I didn't. So the sigmoid function uh, really looks like. To draw. Let me annotate. So the sigmoid function. Uh, sorry. The sigmoid function looks like this. Where. This is the X, this is the Y, the X, this is one, this is minus one, this is zero. So between minus one and one, or so either is giving you values minus one or one, or sometimes, I mean, because it's a range, you can decide to choose either is giving you values zero or one, or you can choose that it goes from minus zero to one. Because it's just a range, you can always shift this range as well. So this is the, how the sigmoid function looks like. It's a, it's a hyperbolic tan function. So um, it gives you values between minus one and one, zero and one, minus one and zero, based on how you are doing your classification. Okay. And then next, I talk about neural network. It's also another time. Okay, Imara says the illustration is not clear. Um, Uh, let me try to uh, make an appropriate illustration. behaves okay so as we saw in the linear regression case um here where we saw the linear the simple linear regression here i now show you the logistic regression how it looks like and then as i said the logistic regression um has this form which you call the sigmoid function as well has this form where our values are ranging between zero and one or you can have. Oh, we can see the screen, oh, sir. Sorry, sorry. Can you see now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yes. Um, so in the linear regression, we saw how the linear regression looked like um, that. And then we had a function, uh, which we said this function was, uh, we could write this function x and this will really fit our curve uh, by this simple linear regression of course um, if we have a logistic um, regression as well where we said that uh, for the logistic regression the main idea is for classification and not for prediction of uh, prediction of anything all we need to do um, is that we said we have values in that sense where they are between zero and one, which is one is uh, one is yes, zero is no, one can be dead or alive. We are classifying, classifying. So if you have patients coming to the hospital, you can classify these patients as dead or alive, right? Or you can, if it is a spam, if it's an email you are reading in your e uh, inbox, you can classify these emails as 
spam or not spam. If it is um, if it is a cancer picture that you are seeing, you can classify these cancer pictures as malignant or benign. If it is COVID uh, images you are seeing, you want to classify them as COVID, uh, pneumonia, uh, normal, you can classify them. In the earlier one, I showed you an uh, example that we did where we did a classification labeling, where we said zero is a normal patient, one is a COVID patient, two is a pneumonia, just from the images. So we classify the images in this sense of classification. Okay, and then with that, we are able to then use this classification to do whatever that we are we want to do. So um, this is what the logistic regression algorithm is doing. And this is how I said it. So here you have on your X and your Y axis. So you have your, on this axis here, and then you are also on, on this axis here. But right, you have your X here. Let's say you have your G of X, right? Your G of X here. Your G of X here, and your X here. So, if you take um, your X, if you take the X and you put it in, you either fall between, uh, you fall on this uh, line here, okay? So all that you are saying is, it's either you are one, it's either you are one, or if you are here, you are zero. And this is what, this is you. This this does um, in the in the logistic regression um, approach. So, okay. So next one, I'll talk about neural networks. So neural networks, we have feed forward neural networks, or propagation neural networks, and so many times. So a neural network process. Processes an input vector to a resulting output vector through a model inspired by neurons and their connectivity in the brain. So we talk about linear regression, logistic regression. Now we talk of neural network as examples of supervised learning. So a neural network consists, let me annotate. So resulting output vector through a model inspired by neurons and their connectivity in the brain. So for, for those who are not doctors, uh, maybe if you have, if you have, a, if you have, a, you have this kind of connections for the neuron. Right, where we have some joints here, some joints here. So this is how uh, a neuron is looking like. And then we say that it said the neural network processes an input vector to a resulting output vector. The model consists of layers of neurons interconnected through weights that alter that alter the importance of certain inputs over others. So very, very important, importance of certain inputs over others is really important to understand them. Okay, so how does the neuron look like? Maybe for those who are not medical doctors, I don't know, maybe I can draw briefly some architecture of how the neuron looks like. If I'm, if I'm not correct, please forgive me, I'm not a medical doctor. So um, we have this architecture.
Was that was someone asking a question? Okay. So uh, Gwendolyn, did you want to say something? Hi. Um no, I was just um answering someone's question in the chat about um, uh, okay, 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 okay. All right. So um, just for a bit of an idea on how the neuron looks like. So for the neuron, you have uh, a neuron, just a pictorial view is that you have some axons. Uh, let me, let me, let me write it well. You have some axons here. And this is what we call the outputs. In this case, this is your Y1, your Y2, that's what we wrote. And then we have the inputs here, right? This is your X1 up to Xn. And then this input here has what we call the dendrite, right? That looks like that, that is looking like that. And then we have the axon trunk, right? The axon trunk, or what we call the trunk. So this is exactly how the, the, the neural network also um, behaves or the kind of design that we have. So it consists of layers of neurons. So you can see that this is like one neuron. And then if we have to add another neuron to it and then add another neuron to it and another neuron to it in a layer form, then that the model consists of layers of neuron interconnected through weights that determine the importance of certain inputs over others. And each neuron includes an activation function that determines the output of the neuron as a function of its input vector multiplied by its weight vector. The output is computed by applying the input vector to the input layer of the network, then computing the output of each neuron through the network in a feedforward fashion. So what? So this is the neural network. Um, this is the neural network uh, architecture. So you see that here we have an input layer. We have an input layer, and then uh, from the then we have a hidden layer. Okay, a hidden layer. Then we have an output. Of course, as I said, if the output can be one, can be two, can be three, depending on what you are looking for. So usually, as is as we explained earlier, I, the, okay, so I'm not going to talk about everything. Honestly, I, I cannot. I will talk about the main things. And then, as I said, in general, I give you some examples for you to go into, but there are a lot of extensions for these things. People are always trying to develop new connections, connectivities, new architectures and stuff. So uh, probably I will not address all the problems in the world today. Okay, so an important thing is uh, that we have a feed forward mapping and then we have a back propagation. Uh, so first, first you, you do the mapping, the, the function mapping that we spoke of, then it does a back propagation. That is where it is doing the learning, right? And what is this back propagation? So the back propagation means you apply an input vector and compute the output vector. Then you do, the, you compute the error, which is the actual versus the desired result, then propagates back Okay, then do a back propagating to adjust the weights and biases starting from the output layer again. So, <coughs> so the whole this neural network stuff is like this. There are some hidden layer here, there are some outputs. First, you do your function, 
you compute your, you do your mapping uh, function, all right? You do your mapping function and then, and then once you do your mapping function to the desired output, the desired output, then you tell yourself, is it closer to the actual output? All right, the actual, the actual uh, vector that we are looking for. If it is not, then it creates this error or it creates, it goes back here and adjusts this way to what we call a back propagation methodology. So with, with that, it then goes again, adjusts this way and compares to the input again, and then goes back to, to adjust all the map, the, the map, the function mapping again. So it gets um, a better performance. And this is what we mean by this, uh, this is what we mean by the back propagation approach. Another method of course is a decision tree. So the decision tree is also a supervised learning method for classification. The algorithms of this variety create trees that predict the result of an input vector based on decision rules inferred from the features, pre features present in the data. The decision trees are useful because they are easy to visualize so you can understand the factors that lead to a result. So example, if you have, uh, if you have, if you have this uh, data where it says sleepy, hungry, good mood, productive. Sleepy, no, hungry, no, good mood, no, no productive. If you have such a data, right? where you are asking people, uh, are they sleepy? Are they hungry? Are they in a good mood? Are they productive? You use this kind of data where you see no hungry, no, good mood, no, not productive. Sleepy, no, hungry, yes, good mood, no, not productive. Sleepy, yes, hungry, no, no, good mood, no, not productive. If you have such a data, then you, you can create a decision tree. The decision tree just says, Good mood, yes or no. If it is, if it is yeah, if it is yes, sleepy, yes or no. If it is yes, hungry, yes or no. If it is yes, then it gives you not productive or productive. And in, you are just trying to predict in this session. So you see, from a decision tree, you can easily create um, also using this idea of supervised learning. And then decision tree, you can easily do so. Usually good for visualization, and that you're able to easily understand. And we we have a lot of data that is that kind of uh, comes in this form to predict productivity, to predict excellence, anything like that. We can use decision trees as well. So the two types of models that exist for decision trees are classification trees, where the target variable is a discrete value, and and the leaves represent the class labels, okay? As I, as, as I showed in this example here. And then we have the regression trees where the target variable can take continuous values. And then you can use a data set to train the tree, which then builds a model from the data. You can then use trees for decision-making with unseen data with unseen data by walking down the trees in that sense. Uh, we have several types of decision tree algorithms. Um, some of them are, um, one, some of the earliest ones were iterative dichotomizer, which works by splitting the data sets into two separate data sets based on a single field in the vector. And then the goal is to select the, a field from the vector that gives us the best result, or let me say the best energy kind of entropy stuff. Then we have the C4.5, which came after ID3, and multivariate adaptive regression splice, which builds decision trees from improved numerical data handling. Okay. So the next one that I want to talk about, uh, just so we can see how we can use uh, these kind of methods to to develop uh, some of the things is really to present some uh, 
basic prob some problems that we can actually combine. Uh, let me do view full screen. Okay, so for instance, sometimes you have some um, mathematical models of when, when, for instance, you want to determine if we can create vaccination. This is a, this is a public health uh, example where we are going to combine data and then models, uh, real models to make decisions, right? So in that sense, uh, we can consider example like a COVID case. Uh, I'll not talk about COVID and all that, but let's consider a COVID case. This is a case of Ghana where we have data from real data that we want to apply some machine learning techniques and stuff to this data. So if you have real data, you plot this COVID, you can see it is going up and up. The cumulative the sum keeps going like a staircase function. And then this is a total vaccination as well. So there are many ways, there are many things that you can do. Some of the things that we do are for public health is uh, or public health in the terms of epidemiology models is to create some epidemiological models. Uh, these are SIR models, SEIR models, and so many things. Yes, Adam, I'm listening. Okay, thank you. Yeah, the question has to do with the previous uh, slides. Okay, go on. Yes. Yeah, you talked about the neural network, the decision, uh, is it the decision trees, yeah. and then the logistic regression. So, the logistic and the, regression. of course, there's a support vector machine. I didn't talk about that. And there oh, are many okay. other types of supervised learning methods. Okay, and I think there is a naive uh, bias too. There's so also I naive wanted... base. Exactly. Yeah. So I wanted to find out what to account. At what point would you want to apply or use any of these uh, of these approaches? So of course, uh, what I when I started, I said if you have linear regression, uh, is for prediction outputs, right? Prediction uh, forecasting. Logistic, I said for classification. So you can classify. You can do logistic classification. Yeah. If you want to classify whether a patient came to the hospital, he died. Malaria, we diagnosed that he had malaria, he died. Uh, another one came, he had malaria, he didn't die. We want to check what is, what is the feature that is making patients die when they come to hospital with malaria? And how can we attend to their patients immediately? What are the features that are important? What features can we take to determine critical cases? And these are what you can use some of these uh, approaches to do. So you can choose, okay, the patient came, he had HB of six, um, he blood group A plus, AA, -A -A, uh, O plus, phenotype or temperature 36, has eye color brown, uh, skin color normal, um, gram positive, he has gram positive uh, bacteria, gram negative bacteria, um, so many of these things, uh, the, the patient talks, uh, for you, you get all this data, then you want to know um, at the end, maybe after two days, the patient died. You took the same uh, vitals the next day, after two days, the patient died. Another patient comes in, you do the same thing, critical malaria treatment. You want to know what should I do? How, what, what is the most critical, what are the five most critical vital statistics or signs to see to determine if this patient is in critical situation or not. This is the, these are the kinds. So you, in the end, you know that they died or they lived, but you want to determine what features should I consider? To, what is the distinguishing feature between the, those who lived and those who died so that I can save those who died? So those are the kind of decisions you are taking with this kind of approach when you are doing your machine learning in this sense. Okay. So, um, of course, uh, you, you always have to check, do you want to do a forecasting problem or you want to do a classification problem? Uh, those are also questions you may have to ask. Do you want to classify the images that are coming from the patients with x-rays uh, saying they have pneumonia, they have COVID? Do you want to use that as classification 
to determine so that if the patients come to the hospital, you tell them, go and bring us your x-ray and then you can use it to determine whether they have pneumonia or COVID or they have pneumonia or malaria. Or you want to use their blood samples. As Those are all features that you can use as for classification or for forecasting. You want to forecast. Um, patients came with this uh, prognosis, these features, um, what is going to happen next? You want to forecast. You want to forecast the COVID cases. So in this example, you see that we are trying to forecast. We say, okay, this is the trend. Can we forecast the next? Can we forecast the future? The future of the, how this trend is going to be. This is forecasting. So classification is there, forecasting is also there. So I talk about um, this particular one for forecasting um, example. Um, it's not linear regression, but you see it has a lot of some ideas of regression in it. And then we do some feed, uh, machine learning techniques as well. So if you have such a model for vaccination where patients are susceptible, they are exposed, this is COVID, uh, they are asymptomatic carriers of the virus, they are hospitalized uh, or they are infected here, uh, they recover, then they are vaccinated, they are done. When COVID came, initially when vaccination started, they said everybody should get, if you get one shot, you are safe. So we all decided to go and take one shot. Then we realized that we're not safe. So if you have a one shot, then we say that we can develop a mathematical model for this. This is a mathematical model that kind of encompasses this drawing here, compartmental models. Then we can do some uh, analysis on this model we do some parameters. We do parameter estimation, linear regression, or oh, this is not linear, but least squares. Then we find the parameters involved, uh, what parameters, how the parameters should look like. This guy, this guy, this guy. These are all parameters we want to know something about. So in the end, we do some parameter estimation, and then we try to use it for forecasting. Right? So you do your parameter estimation and then you try to do forecasting. Once you try to do the forecasting, so this is the forecasting. Once you do your regression or this is some type of linear least squares regression, then now you can forecast the infection. How long is it going to be? What is the behavior of the infection from the data that we have? So this is the data. We do best fit and then we get the parameters as we, I showed in the linear regression example, now this is a bit more complicated, but we still do the same techniques. And then you can get the data, the parameters that fits your model for infection. So this helps you to know, okay, how is the infection going to be like? For those, um, in, for those exposed, how is the infection going to be like? For those hospitalized, what is the future? Then you see that, oh, for, for in that case, this is how the infection is going to look like. For vaccination, uh, if we vaccinate more and more, the disease is going to go down gradually. So this is how we do forecasting normally without machine learning. This is how we do forecasting. Of course, then we did a double vaccination came in. For double vaccination, we knew that you have to take first shot, second shot. Uh, so you can consider this as the Johnson and Johnson vaccination model. And then you can consider this as the AstraZeneca where you need double shots to be fully vaccinated or so, so they were told. So you have your SEI, which is the asymptomatic carriers, symptomatic carriers. There are those who are quarantined, those who are hospitalized and those who have recovered. So we try to introduce all this from this model then we develop this model from, uh, from this uh, diagram, compartmental diagram here. We have this model here. Then we can talk about the basic reproduction number, the control production number. We do a parameter estimation of the model with the data that we have. And then this gives us the right parameters for our work. Then it tells us for forecasting the behavior of the model over time over 1,600 days, maybe three years. 
And then now the vaccination is going to be for the exposed people as well over some number of days. Um, but then you can apply the neural network idea again. So now I come back to the supervised, right? Supervised. So we create a neural network. Now using the input data from the COVID data, the COVID data we have as our input data. And it doesn't matter, it could be the vaccinated class, it could be the infected, all the types of data we have, we can use. Then it will tell us, it will be able to then forecast well how the COVID um, problem is going to be in some days or some years. So this is the, what we call the uh, neural network for uh, epidemiology, uh, where we use existing data, we use the mathematical data and then as the data, real data from, from the health services, and we use mathematical models that we are also developing as well. And then when we do that, we are able to create um, a, a network that is able to predict or forecast appropriately based on the data. How does it do? So we consider some types of neural network. I didn't talk about, so I said we have neural networks, but there are several types of neural networks. In this case, I want to talk about recurrent neural networks. So recurrent neural networks are used to learn problems involving sequential data. Examples of recurrent neural networks are long short-term memory which is a variant of the recurrent neural network used to handle sequential data like time series data. So when, you're, when your data is like a time series, you can think of recurrent neural network as a way to learn the data. Or you can use bi-directional long short-term memory, uh, which, is a which is structured in a way that allows for both backward and forward propagation. I spoke to you about back, uh, backward propagation and then I also spoke to you about the forward propagation earlier on through the sequential layers. And then we have the gated recurrent units. So these are all different types of neural networks, just the architecture, how, mm -hmm. how you, the architecture looks like, what you combine gives you a new uh, idea of how the neural network is look like. Uh, so this is the gated recurrent unit, which is used to improve, improve performance of the LSTM and reduce the number of parameters that we will have to look for. So this is how the architectures look like. So on the extreme left, we have the long short-term memory. In the middle, we have the bi-directional long short-term memory. And then on the extreme left, uh, right, we have the gated recurrent, neural, uh, recurrent unit. So you can see that we have, for the long term, for the long short-term memory, we have an input, we have some, uh, the, we have some input. We have, I'm not sure if you can see very clear. We have I, and then we have some plus here. We have the sigmoid function. So this is how the architecture looks like in general. The architecture means what you are combining. Uh, uh, excuse me. Okay, then, so these are three different types of uh, recurrent neural networks. And, uh, uh, okay, fine. Then the residual neural network um, of course, uh, from a mathematical point, we know how uh, it behaves like. And then, as I spoke again earlier on, I spoke about metrics. We use some metrics to be able to determine um, this supervised learning framework. We have some metrics. What, what are these error metrics? We have, uh, I, I present here three of them. Uh, one of them is a root mean squared error metric. Uh, the other one is the mean absolute percentage error. And then a third one is the explained variance. So root mean square metric uh, is very popular, is well known. I'm sure you all know it as well. Um, it's just 
take the, the difference in your data and your actual results, the square of them, sum them up over the number of points, find a square root. This is the root square. Then the mean absolute percentage error is that find the y minus y hat over y percentage hundred over n sum squared error. So um, the explained variance measures the variation in the predicted y as explained by the neural network algorithm. So uh, this is the variance method as well. Then we spoke, I, I, um, I spoke about the training and the tests, right? So in this case, you can see we have a test data and a training data. And you can see that we, for iteration one, let's take iteration one. So example for iteration one, you see that if we just take iteration one, we have split the data into two, test and then the training. We use the, the chunk for training and then we use a few of the data for uh, sets for, for testing, okay? But we have something we call K-fold validation or K-fold cross-validation. What is this and why do we need it? So cross-validation is used to determine how well your model can predict the outcome of unseen data. So if you want to know if your model can really predict the outcome of unseen data, we, we say we use K-fold uh, validation, cross-validation. What does it mean? It means that you take your data, you take your data, okay? You take your data set. This is your test. This is your train. Then what you do is that you do a first iteration. Then you do a second iteration. For the second iteration now, you, you do some testing, you do some training, some testing, and then more training and so on. So the same, what you do is you, you take your test data and your training data and you use your, you run several iterations, changing, the, changing how you are doing the training and the testing. Basically to give you an idea of whether it is, is the right thing. So if you take your data, you create test, train, you run it as, Run sample one, sample two, and you do now you take the same data, but now you say, okay, I do a I do a train, I take some part for testing, and I take I do I take some part for training again. So this idea that you use is what we call the K-fold cross validation, and it works well uh, for limited data sample, and also offers an evaluation that is less biased. Of course. Uh, we call it K-fold cross-validation because you are splitting, uh, the data is split, uh, the data sample is split into K number of smaller samples, right? So what does it mean? It means that if you have, if you have your data here and then you say, okay, I use this for testing and then the rest is for training, then, Next, the same data sets I split into four. Now I use the I use the first portion for training, and then the testing I take from an, another set. So you try to change the sets that you are using for your testing uh, k times. So if you split your data into four parts, you take this part for testing, this part for training. Then the next iteration, you only take the training from the second set. Then the third iteration, you take the, the testing from the third set. Then the fourth iteration, you take the training, the testing from the last set. So this is what we call the K-fold cross validation, which is to help you determine how well your model is, and also to avoid issues where maybe. You are using that your maybe in your test data sets, you are more biased than your training data sets. So if you do K, uh, the careful cross validation, avoid such a situation. So in that case, we did for four. So we do for four cross uh, four full cross validation, and we split the data into four random partitions, and then we use 
four, we run the algorithm four times and change the test set and the training set four times. And this is what we do. Um, then we try to develop a, a workflow, which means that uh, we try to now inculcate everything into a dashboard. We are trying to develop a dashboard where now you just have to input your data. You choose which, um, which data you want to use as part of your model. And then you train, you put in your own model, then you run it. So you put in your own model here. So you can put in your own model, you run it, and then you choose which of the algorithms. If you want to run an RNN, recurrent neural network that you want to use, you can choose which of the metrics you want. And then the K fold you want, if you want five fold or three fold or six fold, then it will run everything and give you a good prediction, good, give you a good parameters do a prediction window for you, and then do certainty on, on, the, on, the, on your values as well. Okay, so because time is running out, I can go in and show you some results. So if you do, if you do this, then you can actually check for these uh, methods, which one works best. So we did for uh, LSTM. Of course, we also did for ResNet, Residual Neural Network. Uh, I think I jumped that maybe. Uh, so this is a residual neural network. Uh, it's an input-output methodology where this is typical of the of the <clears throat> supervised learning. So you have an input, you have an input here, then you have your hidden layers here, and then you have an output here. And then this is what the recurrent uh, the residual neural network looks like. So what's that? What's the identity there? The what? identity arrow. Uh, the arrow uh, for 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 ResNet there. What uh, arrow? That arrow uh, from the input uh, towards uh, the. I mean, it, it's other. just to it, it's just to make us um, kind of that is a there's a backward loop. You get it? Oh, the, oh okay. Um, yeah. So okay. So All when right, you so do right. that, now we 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 take our RNNs. We take our RNNs. And then we take our ResNet here. And we, we try to use the same parameters to run and check um, how they behave. And then, of course, we also do our cross validation here uh, just for us to see what is happening. And then we now try to predict the data. So if we use the LSTM, and then the by LSTM, you see that the learning almost the data correctly until it gets to the very end here. Right, and then we have a similar case, the similar problem also for the by LSTM. So this is one, and of course, um, if we do for the gated residual, we realize that we are actually totally lost, maybe because we are not using enough uh, hidden layers or something. We 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 can't tell. We are still investigating this. Um, then the error metrics. So the error metrics tells us uh, which of them has better error performance, which of them performs better. So we compare all the errors. But of course, one thing I didn't tell you is uh, that we also did combine the two. So we have one case where we do RNN, two where we do ResNet, then three where we do RNN plus ResNet, right? A hybrid. So um, I present, of course, in the results, uh, in the solution, in the results, I present that part as well. So where we do some hybrid here. So this case is ResNet combined with RNNs, right? And then we see immediately that if we take only RNNs, then for instance, the root mean square error is really huge. Also the same for the MIP errors are also very huge. And also the same for the EVs, we'll see as well what it means. So the error metrics from the data simulation uh, for ResNet, so for if you use only RNNs, it is not good. So a good one is always to combine the two. And then you see that for EV, the, for this, this error metric, the closer you are to one, the better. And in that case, you see that these values are closer to one, okay? For root mean squared, 
the closer you are going to zero, the better. So you see in that case, these guys here are better than the top. And then also for the MIP, the closer you are to zero, the better. So you see that the last three here are better. Okay, so um, let me try to run quick so that we go for the next break. Yes, then the error metric again. So now we visualize the error metrics um, for us to see uh, what this means as well. And then we, as I said for EV, the closer you are to one, the better. And then for root mean square, smaller values means better algorithms. Okay, then we check for cross validation scores, uh, what it means also in a cross validation, which one performed better, which one didn't do well. And then in all cases, we see that for ResNets, the, even the cross validation are also uh, giving us a good result. And then I'll end the, this session with this talk and hopefully we go for a break and come back and then we continue with um, unsupervised learning. Any questions so far? Yes, Stephen Naka. Yeah, thanks doc for the nice presentation. For me, I'm an infectious disease epidemiologist working with surveillance data. And we have challenges with I said I'm an infectious disease epidemiologist working okay. with surveillance data. Okay. Yeah, so um, we have uh, challenges with confirmation of cases of yellow fever and Lassa fever. Ah, okay. uh, I, want, uh, I wanted to ask if I know the predictors of yellow fever disease or Lassa fever disease, is it possible for me to use this machine learning to yeah. predict? On confirmed cases that have probably had the disease. Is it possible to do what? For me to use machine learning methods to predict yes. on non uh, cases that were not that don't have laboratory confirmation. For that don't have, that have no word. Word. That don't have what? That were not confirmed by lab testing. Ah, okay, 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 okay. Yes, 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 you can. Uh, what diseases did you say? What diseases? Yellow fever or Lassa fever? Yellow. So the question is, do you have data uh, that, that is like um, uh, images showing patients who have yellow fever and then images Vision who have lots of fever or some parameters or some data. Not images. I have your social demographic characteristics and your clinical characteristics. What what is demographic? What do you mean by demographic? Their age, their sex, their location, their occupation. Yes, and then in the end, in the end, you also have on that data that this patient, this first patient has no fever, this patient has lots of fever. The I'm not, I didn't really get the last one. What I'm saying is, what I'm, what I'm saying is, for instance, you have, you have some data, you have patients, right? Yeah. Age, gender, yeah. Uh, temperature, uh, maybe some gram negative, gram positives. Um, what? Yeah, um, yeah, clinical presentations. Those yeah. John this, um, HB, John this, fever, something. You have all this data, right? Steven? Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. But then what I need is we need to label this data. After you have all this, we want to know that, okay, maybe this patient after presenting all this, we were able to diagnose this patient for Lassa or for yellow fever. Yeah. If we can get about 100, 200 of such data, or maybe 1,000 of such data, then we can create a testing, a training test, and a testing test, develop a, a machine learning model 
and then use it to predict future cases. So that in the future, uh, in the future, when a patient comes, uh, we can even decide that we can develop a, an app for you to just tell. So in the future, when the patient comes, or when you go to that village, you say, okay, what is your age? And then even we can decide to restrict it such that it tells us which features really distinguishes Lassa fever from yellow fever. So that in the future, if you go to the village, just take those features and then based on those features, once you get, once you get those features and you put it in, it will tell you clearly this is yellow fever or this is Lassa fever or this is no fever, nothing at all. Or it's none of them. That would be great. Yes. So it's very possible. There's no there's there's no ambiguity. Okay, any other question before we, we, we take a break? Any other question before we, we close we go for a break? All right, if there's no question, then we can go for a break now. And then when we come back. I'll start. I'll talk about unsupervised learning. When, uh, how, how long is the break? Um. So, uh, do you want a one-hour break or a forty-minute break? We can start at me. Forty minutes will do. Is that forty minutes? Forty minutes. Oh, uh. Well. Well, I'm going to now talk about. Um, on supervised learning, and then I'll try to. I was hoping that I could talk about some applications in general, right? General applications of uh, machine learning in real life situations. Um, so, uh, in in that sense, we will be able to talk about some other stuff uh, as well. Uh, then I'll talk about some applications as well uh, in that sense. Um, so let me go uh, briefly to my slides. Can you see my slides? I think it's showing. No, no, it's showing. no we cannot see. Uh, can you see now? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. now it is visible. OK. So uh, we'll run, we'll go through uh, this part, uh, the final part, which is on supervised learning. So again, um, as I said, the supervised learning is where we have the data uh, alongside with our, with our label data sets that we could use some um, feed forward. Uh, some examples of these methods were linear regression, logistic regression. Uh, we could also talk of uh, some support vector. We couldn't speak of our support vector machines, but we actually spoke about linear regression and then also logistic regression we did speak about as well. 
a linear regression for forecasting, um, logistic for classification, and we spoke about other forms as well. Um, here, we are now going to talk about um, unsupervised learning. So as I said, uh, the, the, in this model, we, there is a lack of the critique in, in the sense that uh, we, we have no, on, we have unlabeled data sets. And so because we have unlabeled data sets, um, the training, the testing is a bit different compared to the other, uh, the supervised learning. In the same way as a supervised learning, we have uh, two, uh, two phases. The first phase is the mapping function, where we said the mapping function kind of helps you. In the case of supervised learning, you have a mapping, a mapping function that kind of helps you in your features, feature extractions in that sense. Uh, so here on the supervised learning, the mapping function segments the data into classes. So we, you, you try to data segmentation is the, one of the goals here. Um, and then each input vector becomes uh, part of a class, but the algorithm itself cannot apply labels to these classes. So uh, it, uh, it does not tell, okay, whether this is uh, class for blacks or class for whites. It, it is not classifying this, it cannot do this, but the algorithm is able to use the given data sets, segments the data sets in a certain way. Okay, that creates this kind of classes. The segmentation of the data into these classes, maybe the results, maybe the result. So from which uh, you can then draw your conclusions. So you then can decide whether the data has been segmented into black or white, or the data has been segmented into black or yellow, or the data has been segmented into uh, dead or alive in case of um, maybe patients coming to the hospital or the data has been segmented into male or female. But you, you, do, you do not make this supervised idea of labeling your data where you say, this is male, this is female, this is dead, this is alive, this is black, this is white. You input your data and then the output is a classification of your data based on how many segmentations you are looking for. And this is the main idea uh, in the unsupervised learning. So, uh, for instance, if you have a recommendation system, a recommendation system basically means, uh, example I gave from Amazon or for Netflix, Amazon means uh, it always tells you that those who bought a white shirt um, and a black and a, and, a, and a trousers also probably bought a belt and then a brown shoe. Uh, or if you go to Netflix, it tells you that those who watched uh, maybe a certain action movie, watch another certain action movie, and then it, it, the system then does recommendations. So that the name coming from recommendation just means uh, it is recommending to you based on your inputs, what you probably are likely uh, going to go for. So in the case of recommendation system where the input may represent the characteristics or purchases of a user and the users within a class represent those with similar interests who can then be used for marketing or recommendation system, recommend, product recommendations. So exactly what I have explained to you. Um, you can implement unsupervised learning by variety, uh, using a variety of algorithms. Uh, some of these algorithms are k-means clustering or adaptive resonance theory or so many other uh, algorithms that are existing. Uh, basically, you can see uh, in, as compared to the supervised learning where we had uh, where we had um, some where we had some um, where we had maybe uh, a training data set and then a testing data set. When we are supervised learning, here you see that you know, there is nothing like a training data set and a testing data set. You just give all your data sets, it goes through a certain function, uh, it then tries to then tries to give you a mapping function, uh, and then as a result, it just gives you a cl classes of your data set based on whatever how many classes you choose. So you can then classify, it can give you a class saying, uh, yes, someone signs this up, you can go on. Okay, thank you, Doc. 
So I want to find out in the supervised, I think we have the training and then the testing, the testing uh, yes. data sets. Yes. yes. So do we also have, I don't know, or maybe if later you talk about it, but then do you also have a validation group to see after the testing, you can uh, validate, you know, the predictors that maybe you have you have found using the machine learning approaches? I mean, sometimes people try to split the data into three where they create a testing, tra a training, a testing, a validation. But usually what, are, what is what, is, what the validation actually means um, data that you are now putting into just to test your model. So it's part, it's really part of your testing actually. So that you can say validation, but validation is simply, you can use a validation as a means of uh, some kind of data that is not and trying to test it again to see if it really, uh, the, 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 the function will be able to uh, truly give the right definition of this. But you see, because of the issue, because of the ideas of this K fold validation, right, which I spoke about, because of the K fold validation techniques, which is usually applied, if you remember, I spoke about K fold validation. This idea of the validation data sets is not necessary, I'll say. I'll, I'll say straightforward that you do not need this any, any more ideas of uh, validation. This is catered for in the K fold validation. K food cross validation I, uh, that I spoke about. So if you do your K food cross validation, you are very sure that your data is uh, everything is validated because in essence, you are split your if you do a K in thirty four, you say you do I think it's your one, you say this is your this part here, your your training. So I mean. Let me let me clean them. Let me clean them, and then let me say if you do that, all you are saying is um, if you split your data into four, one, two, three, four, iteration one, you say I use the first set, okay? Or if if there are hundred data points, maybe this is like 25, 25, 25, 25. You say okay, I'm going to use the first set of twenty five as my testing and then the rest as my training. Then you do iteration two, and then in iteration two, you say, okay, I'm going to use um, the testing data set as uh, the second group of data set, right? Maybe from 26 to 50. I'm now going to use from 26 to 50 as my testing data set, and I'm going to use the rest of the data as my training data set. Iteration three, you say, okay, I split it into four. Now I'm going to use the third group. This is maybe from 51 to 75, right? I'm going to use this now as my test and then uh, as my test and then the rest as my training. Iteration four, what I'll do is that I'm going to use the first 75 uh, for training and then the last 25 as testing. And if you do this, this is what we call the K-Food cross validation. And then if you do this, it actually takes care of this idea of uh, some people saying testing, uh, training, testing, and validation, right? Training, testing, and validation. If you do k fold validation test, then this idea of creating another data set for validation is unnecessary. Um, is your answer, is, 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 are you okay? Yes, please, Doc. Okay. So if you want to go ahead, you can implement on supervised learning using, as I said, game mastering, adaptive resonance, or uh, a certain family of algorithms that are called the ART, A-R-T, a family of algorithms that is usually used also for um, supervised learning. So what is K-mean clustering and what does it do? How does it work? So, it's a simple, but it's a really one of the popular clustering algorithms uh, from signal processing. Uh, the goal in K-mean clustering is to partition the, your data sets into K clusters. So based on how many clusters you want, you choose, and then you do, it, it does a K, uh, if you say two clusters, it does, a, it creates a two cluster system for you. 
if you say four clusters, it creates a four flat cluster. So you see here, you can actually see that we are getting some classes. C, B, A. So we have like an A, B, C class. And you can call this, of course, as well, some clusters as well. So exactly what this came in clustering is also doing is clustering or creating a data. Yes. You can also write if your data that is not very strong. Okay, go ahead. Uh, okay, Joe. Uh, so, so I'm I'm looking at um, uh, uh, the the cho choice of uh, number of clusters. How do we make yes. a choice of to say how many clusters we make? Um, that's that's a research question. So. The, the 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 choice on how many clusters you you want to make depends really on your data set. I'll say. Um, so uh, but there are there are existing um, ideas on how to make this um, clustering how to choose this K, right? There are, there, are, there are existing ideas on how to choose this K. Uh, so sometimes the idea is that you can fix your K uh, and then you fix the K and then you, just, you, 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 you watch or you kind of allow the algorithm to itself to, to tell you if it can really work, if, the, if it is going to give you a good class trend or not. So then, Hello? No. Okay, okay. So so you 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 want to the algorithm to, to try and validate whether you are going to get meaningful results from the clustering. Yes, yes, yes. So is it that you can just make some random uh, K points or K choices and then you assign the data to the closest. I mean there, there's a whole way of doing this K class, the K means clustering, right? There's a way a, way, a whole way of doing it. Um but how to choose the K, um, there are ways, there are actually some algorithms to help you define this K means, but I, I really have not tested uh, this idea myself. So I cannot tell much. Okay, so the, the goal of the algorithm is to partition, the, uh, to partition your data set into K clusters, right? And each example, um, where you where you have a some vector, yeah, you try to take uh, distances between the vector. There are some uh, some algorithms, the mathematical uh, underlining these things. Where based, if you have if you input a data, um, so if you input some data, then what happens is it it tries to take. It tries to measure uh, some errors or some distance between these uh, these points, and then uses that to take uh, clusters, uses that as clustering, right? So, if you, for instance, say in this case we have some two um, two clusters, then what we do is that uh, you are partitioning the data into two clusters. And then in that case, what you do is you say, so we take the, you, the distance between the smallest, you know, so you, it creates some, some points here and here. And then it takes each of your data points and then measures how far they are from this center point called the centroid of the cluster, right? So if you have three, if you want to create three clusters, it, creates, it will create another third, uh, third point here. And then based on how close the point is to the cluster point, uh, what I call the centroid of the cluster, it will, uh, it will push or it will make this demarcation of this clustering in this, uh, in this way. So as I said, so how, how do you begin? So what it does is uh, it it's just randomly assigns um, um, each example from the data set into a cluster randomly, just assigns, you, you create two clusters 
it, it randomly assigns the, the points uh, into each cluster, into two clusters. Then it calculates the center of the cluster as the mean of all the members in that cluster. Then I trace the data sets to determine whether and whether the, the example is closer to the member cluster or the alternative. If the member is closer to the alternative cluster, then it moves that it moves this data point into the alternative cluster, and then a centroid is recalculated again. So it, it kind of um, it works it works in in a, in this way that okay once you choose once you choose your once you choose that you want two clusters, it creates these two clusters and then and then splits. Your, your your examples into these two clusters, right? Where one, all the examples are here and all the examples are here. Then it tries to recalculate each of these examples, right? It tries to then calculate the... Uh, then it tries to calculate the centroid then once it calculates the centroid, it looks as how close each member is to the centroid. Um, if it is not too close, then of, of course, it is also done here, how close each member is to the centroid here. And if they are not too, if it is not too close here, it brings it here. And then it recalculates the centroid and then checks again how close they are until finally you get a cluster where they are all close within a certain mean uh, of the centroid, a certain threshold of the centroid in that sense. So the k-mean partitions, uh, partitions the example data set into k clusters without any understanding of the features. So you do not need any understanding. You do not need any feature uh, feature understanding of this. You just go ahead and then you put in your cluster and uh, you put in your data and then it does a clustering. Then there's the adaptive resonance theory. Uh, so that, that adaptive resonance theory, which is the ART, um, is a family of algorithms that provide pattern recognition and prediction uh, capabilities. You, you divide, uh, you can divide it into unsupervised and supervised models as well. And then here, uh, I'm going to talk about our supervised aspects. So the adaptive resonance theory is known to be a self-organizing architecture and it learns new mappings while maintaining existing knowledge. So uh, what it does uh, in the ART, what happens is that you, you, give it, you give it your clustering. Oh, sorry. It does your clustering. It does, uh, sorry, it's, not clustering. Um, so it's a self-organizing architecture, and then it learns new mappings, right, while maintaining the existing knowledge, right? So give it the data, it does a self-organizing of the data itself and then learns new and old one, um, similar to exactly what we mean by this uh, K clustering. But you see that like K, K means clustering, you can use, we have the ART1 uh, for clustering. We have several uh, types of this ART. So if you take the ART, um, you can use the ART for clustering. So this is not ART1, it's ART, sorry. Um, the advantage is that uh, rather than defining K at a runtime, uh, it alters the number of clusters based on the data. So it means that it, so it can change the class, the clustering you give it, it can give it, it can decide to change this, alter the number of clusters based on how much data you are putting in and what's, uh, how close out the features it is learning. It is doing the clustering on the same time. So it includes three main features. A comparison feature, which is used to determine how a new vector uh, fits within the existing categories. A recognition field, which contains the neurons that represent the active clusters and a research model.
Okay, so this is the architecture of the uh, of the ART. Um, so we have an input. We have an input vector here. Then we have the comparison field, recognition field, and then a research model. So three parts is up of your comparison field. A comparison field or a cognition field and a research model. So all what happens is you compare the new features that are that you compare new features to uh, old features, and then uh, you represent those active clusters, and then you try to do a resetting consistently. So this I will try to explain again um, further. Okay. So what do we mean? So that when you when you give the input vector, the comparison field will identify the clusters in which it most closely fits. If the vector matches in the recognition field in the recognition field above a certain parameter, then the connection to the neuron in the recognition fields are updated to account for this new vector. Otherwise, a new neuron is created in the recognition field to account for a new cluster. And when a new neuron is created, the existing neuron weights are now updated, allowing them to retain existing knowledge. So all examples of the data sets are applied until no example is actually seen. Um, then there is a reinforcement learning. So the reinforcement learning, the reinforcement learning is uh, another type of um, also machine learning, um, machine learning model. So we have the supervised, unsupervised, and then the reinforcement learning is a third type. In this type, we are no longer interested in data. In the reinforcement learning, data is not really necessary. We only build and then we build and then we use our rewards uh, as a way of creating data. So um, forget about the name here and look at this example that I, I, I posted here. This example, as I said, uh, the reinforcement learning is uh, like um, how to train a dog, okay, or how children learn. So if, if they learn, if you have a dog and you want to play fetch with it, uh, what you do is you throw your ball, the dog catches it, and then you give it a reward. Then the, when you do that three times and you give it for each of them a reward, the dog immediately realizes that, oh, if I do the if I catch this ball, I get a biscuit or I get a, a bone, and this is the reward for me. Once you start doing that immediately, the dog learns, the dog learns for every fail. If you if it fails and does not get any biscuit or any reward, it realizes immediately that it is being rewarded because of the correct decisions it is taking by catching the ball. And this is exactly what the reinforcement learning is about. It's about reward and actions. You do an action. If it is, if there is a good action, then you get a reward for your action. And this is what enables us to create the data that we need, as well as be able to start uh, like a learning process on, on the uh, alongside it in that sense. So. So reinforcement learning is also a learning model with the ability not just to learn how to map an input to an output, but to map a series of inputs to outputs with dependencies. In reinforcement learning, it exists in the context of states in an environment and then the actions possible at a given state. So there's, there's, there's an environment, there are actions, there are states, and then I'll explain this alongside. So during the learning process, the algorithm randomly explores state and action pairs. So it means that what happens is um, when the, when we are when the algorithm as the algorithm it takes the action I and then an action I and then a state I. Okay. So for every action that the state corresponding to every state it has a corresponding action. Maybe I write it in the other way around. For every state, 
have a corresponding action. So state action, state action in that sense. And then uh, once you keep doing this, then you, keep, you create the, the environment that is going to be needed to develop the right function, right? It's like you're now creating the data. But then you create the mapping, then it uses it to do this uh, idea of rewarding consistently and then learns gradually. So usually uh, in gaming industry, what happens is uh, you, you start with a robot, and then it kicks the ball into a pool, and then once it does that, you say this is correct or this is good, you give it a reward, then it learns that, it, and then once it kicks it outside the post, you say this is bad, then you start the labeling in that sense. And as alongside, you see that it increasingly gets better because it starts to learn what a good reward is and what a bad reward is. And then it decides on what to choose and when to act on those rewards. If it wants a good reward, it knows that it must put the ball into the net. Like the dog, if it wants a good reward, if it wants a biscuit, it knows that if you throw the car, if you throw the ball, it will fetch it for you. Other than that, it doesn't care if it doesn't need that reward. So reinforcement learning exists in that context of states in an environment and actions possible at a given state. During the learning process, the algorithm randomly explores state action pairs within some environments. Then in practice on, of the learned information exploits this action pair reward to choose the best action for a given state that leads to some goal. So <clears throat> it creates states and actions. It learns this process of what, what action do I get for a certain state? It learns it, and then finally, it's able to use it to decide uh, if it wants a certain uh, a certain reward, what it should do. So, reinforcement learning does overcome the problem of data acquisition. So sometimes you do not have data to do certain projects. Reinforcement learning is a way to go and use to claim data that it probably will be helpful to do. Um, one method under reinforcement learning which is really popular and very useful and well-known is the Q-learning, okay? So the Q-learning, um, so sorry for those who are not uh, really uh, mathematical inclined, I, I put it here because I'm mathematically inclined and I like the maths. But Q-learning is one approach to reinforcement learning that enables a model to iteratively learn and improve over time by taking the correct action. The algorithm, the general algorithm for Q-learning is to learn rewards in an environment in stages. So each stage, each stage encompasses taking actions or states until a goal is reached. And during the learning, the actions selected are done so probabilistically. So you do not have to worry, you don't have to do, you don't have to do for every state to be able to get all the information needed. So for instance, in the case of maybe um, a footballer. You, you don't have to say, okay, this is the post. It must hit for every one point. It must hit all the points so that it knows exactly what to do. You don't need it. It does some probabilistic choices. It takes one year, it takes one year, it takes one year, it takes some here, and then tries to see what the reward will be. Q learning is an a reinforcement learning a policy that will find the next best action given a current state. So it chooses this action at random and aims to maximize the reward. So if it wants to get um, some good reward, it knows once it learns, uh, it gets information on a lot of states and actions, it will be able to then subsequently determine uh, what it wants for itself. So example, uh, another one is that a Q learning method uh, which this is the this is how the Q learning goes. So the Q learning is this guy. There's a reward, there's an agent, environment, and an action and state, exactly as I've tried to explain. And then we have it is a model free. That means you do not have to introduce your own models. You just create your reward, your agent in an environment and state, and then decide on the actions. 
uh, of policy reinforcement planning that will find the best course of action uh, given the current state of the agent. So depending on where the agent is in the environment, it will decide the next action that it will take. So an example of queue learning, um, popular one is you take an advertisement recommendation system, uh, the normal ad advertisement recommendation system, for instance, uh, you say that you, you, your, you get ads based on your previous purchases. Example, as I explained, the, uh, going to watch uh, movies on Netflix or buying stuff from Amazon. So the ads you get are based on your previous purchases on the website you may have visited. So for instance, if you visit some, uh, some sites, uh, sometimes they track you and then they send you subsequently uh, suggestions for some further sites as well. If you bought a TV, you will get recommended TVs of certain brands. So if you go to Amazon, you buy a TV, um, the next time it will start asking, uh, recommending, The next time it will start giving you um, recommending TV brands, uh, different TV brands for you as well. Okay, so next, um, that I'll try to wrap up on supervised learning is to present some. Um, so this is not this is not on supervised learning stuff. So this is uh, partly to wrap up uh, the the lecture is to talk about applications of learning methods. So we have several algorithms, several networks that do different things. And I'm sure maybe if you've heard of, if you are a practitioner or you are, you, you are learning, you will be hearing some people talking about certain neural networks and then what they do. So these are real known that certain neural networks are now known to perform in a certain way and perform certain tasks as well. So example is a convolutional neural network. Uh, if you are doing uh, um, tasks based on imaging, uh, almost everybody will tell you to go to convolutional neural network. Of course, uh, even that they are now much more faster and efficient neural network techniques in imaging under convolutional neural network. So our architectures in imaging that does really perform excellently now uh, compared to existing architectures as well. So for image recognition task, uh, each input you have in your neural network or the feed forward neural network is a pixel. So if you, if you are doing image recognition or classification task, you put in your image, but this image um, is seen as a pixel, or uh, is pixelated, what I'll say. So for instance, in this case here with the bed, with the bed here, this will be, will be seen as pixels, right? It will be seen as pixels, and then each pixel will be then assigned a value. So, however, this is not ideal. Um, there are no connections between nodes in the layer. So in practice, this means that the spatial contents of the features in the image are lost. Um, in other words, pixels that are close to one another in an image are likely more correlated than pixels on opposite sides of the image. But the feed-forward neural network does not take this into account. So, I mean, if you, you've done any form of imaging work, you see that it tries to take the images into pixels, uh, something looking like this, right? And then gives them these values of um, if, it is a, if it is a black and white image, it gives it a value of zero and one. If it is a colored image, then it gives it an RGB um, value. It gives them RGB values along, it, along with it. So this is how the images are. They, are. they are kind of pixelated and then use these pixels to do your simulation. But the issue is, as explained here, uh, if you do these pixels, then you are sure that Pixels close to each other are more related than those far away. So if you take this portion here, the pixels closer to one another here will be more related than the pixels closer to one another here. And similarly, if you take this side, 
you see that the pixels closer to one another will be more related than those, for instance, in this portion. So these are then pixels of image uh, that we that are used. So if you have your image, this is what you usually will put in as your input, and then you create you create your layers, and these layers you create them yourself. You can create them on how many um, based on the number of how many how many hidden layers you want, and then the depth as well of each hidden layer. So this hidden layer, maybe if we say the depth. It means you have one, two, three, four, okay? Uh, five. So has a depth of five. This has a depth of five. This has a depth of five. And then the hidden layer is three. So you can increase this depth, for instance, to 100. You can increase this uh, number of hidden layers, for instance, to 1,000. And this is what you can do. And then in that sense, it will, what you are going to do is you are going to classify the images, maybe in this sense, into if the image is a dog, a bed, or a cat, it will be able to classify your image for you. And similarly, if it is malaria or COVID, it will be able to classify them for you as well, whenever you make your input as well. So example, or I'm not, is this picture clear? This is, uh, this is a picture I wanted to use uh, as example for convolutional neural network. Uh, it takes your input is a tensor. The tensor is in the in the is, is a, with a shape. That means the number of inputs, the height, the width, the number of channels. These are all the inputs. So the input could be in this case. Uh, we can see the input is two, and then we have some max pooling. Um, another max fully and a fully connected, fully connected network. What does this mean? So for convolutional neural network, you have a pooling layer, uh, which includes local or global pooling layers along with traditional convolutional layers. So the pooling layers reduce the dimensions, right, of data by combining the outputs of the neurons at one layer into a single neuron. So these pooling layers they do dimension reduction, right? They do dimension reduction. This one as well. Then now, this is a convolution. This is a convolution. This is a fully connected. So what is the fully connected as well? So just an example of architecture, how an architecture looks like. So fully connected uh, means that they connect every neuron to one layer to every neuron in another layer. And it's the same as what we call the traditional multi-layer perceptual neural network. And this is what a convolutionary neural network architecture looks like. Um, next. I tried to also talk to you about some other applications here as well. So we have natural language processing. So for natural language processing, uh, it's a way to communicate to computers or computer programs to understand human language as it is spoken and written. And this is what we call the natural language. So it's also part of the AI machine learning framework as well, where people use um, um, tools to be able to predict languages or translate languages as well. So here in, in, in UCC, um, uh, for me, uh, I'm involved in, uh, I'm a co-founder for Ghana NLP, for instance, where we have developed this app using this kind of uh, technology that translates uh, languages in Africa, uh, as well as this plant aid app, which is able to, which is uh, in collaboration with Coastal Artificial Intelligence, also in Ghana, which is able to detect diseases in plants. And this you can extend to diseases in humans as well, or animals as well. And these are all ongoing applications or some of the applications that you can do for machine learning uh, as well. Okay, so any question before I end here and then the next session, 
I'll try to do demonstrate uh, one or two examples on how to implement uh, some of these um, architectures and machine learning uh, stuff. Before I go on, so any questions? Any question? There is a question in the chat. Okay, Adam, ask a question whilst I try to get a chat. Okay, thank you. So, irrespective of the approach, which is that, let's say you take whether supervised or, or supervised. Uh, approach at the end of the day if you may if you may want to uh, develop an app you can still use either of them uh, i didn't get your question hello is it a question uh, i'm listening hello hello yes, i Go was ahead. asking that so yeah i said irrespective of the approach okay so irrespective of the approaches that the let's say you may take can you whether the supervisor or unsupervised can you still arrive or can you still use it to divide uh, to develop an app Yeah, yeah, I mean, those ones, Hello. Uh, what, you, what you are using, can you hear me? Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can hear you. Yes, uh, please, so, I can hear you now. Uh -huh, so what yes, I mean please. is the, the algorithm, the, the, the type of learning tool you use for, your, for any, any model that you want to do, is is not it has nothing to do with the app you may want to develop. Uh, so the app you are developing is on its own. And then if you want to do reinforcement learning, of course it's up to you. It's your your models that are most important. But in in essence, yes, you can use any of them to develop um, your your models. Please, you get it. Yes, please. All right. So, um, someone was asking if there is a difference between. Uh, let me go and read it again. If there's a link between Q learning and Bayesian decision theory, um, I think I've seen uh, uh, there's there's a linkage. There's a linkage. Um, if you're doing reinforcement learning. Uh, reinforcement learning, you can actually write it as an optimization problem. Uh, I just, uh, I hope you understand what I'm saying. You can write it as an optimization problem. And um, once you do that, it has a, a bit of a connection with the Bayesian optimization as well, I think. But there are, there are research articles, there are articles that tries to um, establish um, the differences or the similarities or how you can combine the two at, as well. Uh, please, is this okay? So, because I know that the, the, the Bayesian I know that the Bayesian, um, the Bayesian optimization technique is uh, a known stateless, uh, is, is known to be a stateless uh, method. So in that case, it is really closely related to reinforcement learning, I'll say. But, 
Of course, this um, I have not really done um, any kind of work on it before, so I will not talk heavily on that. Um, I'm a bit lost here. Okay, so I'll end here and then we'll take some 10 minutes break. And then I'll try to finally uh, take you through one example of maybe how to implement, um, I don't know whether I should say a simple, um, simple case, uh, how to go about it step-by-step step, or I'll try to take you through an example. And those who have time, if you open your laptops as well, you may go side by side with me or after you can just uh, watch the, this part of the video and try to implement it on your own. Or I'll share the, I'll share the, I'll share the code as well so that maybe you can have it and test it or run it on your own as well. So any question before we take a quick break? All right, so, all right, if there's no question, then please uh, let's stop here and then we'll take a, maybe some 15 minutes break or 20. And then we do the last part, which is kind of try to get a hands-on session on this. All right, well, let's continue. Well, what are we doing for the hands-on session? Yeah, so if you have installed uh, well, Python, if you have installed Python on your program yeah. or your laptop, it's fine. Uh, if not, do you want That's to true. use, uh, you want to use Google Collab, you can go to Google, and then if you have a Google uh, email account, then you can already use Google Collab as well. So it means you can do a Google Collab and then stop typing or writing your code there. Okay, any question I, again? All right, if there's no question, I pause here and then we'll continue later. Um, we are back for the final part. Um, so, unfor unfortunately, what I I'm running my I'm running the code so I can show you what is happening, and it's taking some time. I expected it to be done within ten minutes, but I think it's gone beyond that. And nonetheless. Um, Hopefully once, by the time it's it's at the end, we would have been through everything step by step. So in this case, good. So um, this project uh, is about detecting pneumonia cases, okay? Uh, so we did we did some projects here. One was, uh, what I'm going to talk about today is detecting pneumonia cases. Then we extended it to um, pneumonia and um, COVID cases. Pneumonia and COVID cases as well. And then extended it to plant diseases as well, and so on and so forth. So this is just the basic uh, foundation uh, that I feel of a lot of uh, information. Uh, but I feel once if you understand it very carefully, uh, you'll be able to also do something similar. I've also shared um, an example in the chat. Uh, in the chat, you have an example where we have image classification. Uh, there where there is classification of images, uh, this is from TensorFlow. And so also the same, if you go through this example step-by-step, step, it's self-explanatory and we'll be able to tell you um, how images are classified using some particular types of uh, networks, uh, architectures. Of course, uh, there are several architectures and uh, based on what you want to do, you can play around them as well. So maybe if I show you the one from TensorFlow, um, can you see my screen? Do you see that? Do you see my the TensorFlow one? Yes. 
Okay, yes. perfect. So, so of course, this is a TensorFlow one. If you go there, uh, you can even go and click run in Google Colab. It will open it in Colab. Okay. And then in the Colab, it will take you through step by step uh, all the parts of the code. So it will take you through how to set it up, uh, how to explore data, how to load, load data, how to visualize data, how to configure your data sets for performance, how to standardize the data, and then how to create your model, a very simple model, how to visualize the training results, how to check for overfitting, data augmentation, how to do dropouts, how to compile and train your model, how to visualize the training results, how to predict new data, and then some other stuff as well. So very, very simple, but uh, important stuff. So the main task, the main thing uh, in this particular uh, TensorFlow example is that it's a tutorial that shows you, as I said, image classification of flowers. Of course, it can be classification of uh, gender. It can be also classification of plants. It can be diseases, plant diseases, skin diseases, human diseases, and so on and so forth. Okay, so that's what that's what it can be. Um, then the idea of this tutorial is to demonstrate two concepts, efficiently loading data sets, and then identifying overfitting and applying techniques to mitigate them, and including data augmentation and dropouts. So let me see if my own, the one I'm running is done. Then after I can also show. Okay, it's still running, it's still running. Running, running, running. All right, so the basic machine where machine learning uh, workflow, examine and understand the data. Data is important, labeled data. Then build an input pipeline, build a pipeline, build your model, train your model, test your model, improve the model, repeat. Very, very simple, right? So, and I made sure that during the whole course or during this model, I try to explain each of these parts. Um, maybe, uh, maybe my mistake might be I didn't explain, maybe I didn't have a chapter or a section on data or data and data labeling and stuff like that, but it shouldn't be a problem. Um, so this first, you need to examine your data and then understand the data. You need to see, uh, understand your data. Then you build, you build a pipeline. So after you build your pipeline, then you build your model. You train the model exactly what we said. If you have the data, if you have the data, let me annotate. You have your input. This is the data. Then you have some hidden neurons, the layers here, and then you have some outputs, right? Where they are connected in this way, and so on and so forth, right? And so on and so forth. Okay, so this guy, this part here is your input data. And then this one here is your output data, your input, and then in between of your hidden layer. As I said, the hidden layer, you can have, or you have a depth, right? A depth, and then a width. So you can decide, okay, I want, 50 hidden layers, 
each of them should have 20, um, each of them should consist of 20, to consist of 20 uh, neurons, something like that. So then you do your training, you build your model, you train, as we said, the data sets, use some for training, use some for testing. So you have a training and a testing, and then after this training and testing helps you to kind of improve your model as well. So how do we go about? So first, we try to set up certain libraries. Some things are libraries that are needed. Uh, one of them is matplotlib is a library. So you need this library and then this plot function. Uh, you need NumPy library. You need a PIL library, and then you need a TensorFlow library. So each of these libraries has a function. Matplot library is usually used for plotting functions, uh, NumPy library for calculations and other stuff. And then TensorFlow uh, library is for doing machine learning, deep learning work. So from TensorFlow, from TensorFlow, import the Keras. Keras is a library of um, a library that contains several images there. There are a lot of images, it's an image library. And then uh, from Keras, uh, import layers. And then from Keras models, import sequential models. So we have layers, we have inputs. This is your data, this is kind of a data imaging data. You have layers defined from Keras, and then you have some sequential models. So models that we'll be using. Then let's go to the data. So next we download and explore the data. Um, this tutorial uses 3,700 photos of, of flowers. The data set contains five subregions, one per class. So there is a is a is a big folder. It's a big folder called flowers. Flowers. And then in each of them, we have subfolders. One is daisy, one is roses, another subfolder, another subfolder, sunflower, another subfolder, uh, tulips, and so on. Five subfolders or subdirectories, we call them. Then we import the path. So your data should be stored in a certain path. That is what we are doing here. Then this directory where your data is, um, is a Kira. Uh, we, call, we call this file by using this uh, you get file from Kira that is able to get the whole zip folder from the whole zip folder, photo for uh, flower photo folder yeah, which contains all these subfolders or subdirectories there. And then we create a path where this data will be. Then you download, <clears throat> you download your data and then you now keep them in. So this flower photo is in Google. So you go there, using this data set URL. And then with this data set URL, you'll be able to download that folder now into your machine. And then you now create a path where the data should be. So you say that I want my data should be maybe on my desktop. So that is the path library that data should be. Then you start by maybe you say, okay, I want to know how many images are there? How many images are there in this folder? So you can check by say image count, the length of the images, then you do an image count. Then here is, it prints for you that there are 3,600 total images. You want to know how many of them are roses, how many of them are tulips, how many of them are all the types. So you can just do that. And in that sense, all you do is, if you say roses list, you go to roses subfolder, it will give you the number of roses there, the number of uh, files which are roses and so on, each of them. And then now you can load 
your data, you can load this data into your into your you load this data now in onto your system. So now you do that by saying um, you define some parameters, the batch size, the height of the image. So you want the images to be all of them to be of a certain height and width. And then, <clears throat> so as you, you can see here, we do a validation split, right? When developing the model. So we use 80% of the images for training and 20% for the validation. Yay, I already taught you this, right? So you know what to do uh, for your splitting, 80% to 20%. And then you, you write, okay, train data sets. Uh, now you decide on what to use for training data sets. Validation split point two for training, subset point training. And then you do also validation data sets, validation split point two. And then you can find the class names in the class names. So you have class names, train data sets, class names. So this here, train data sets, create, create a class name for it. And, I, and then you create a class name and then you attribute, uh, you can find the class names in the class names attribute of these data sets. And then after what you can do, so already we can actually run this. We can start running all of them. Uh, I have it on my machine so I can run them and it will tell me the right thing. So um, you can create a, the data sets. Now you can visualize the data sets, right? That you, you have just downloaded. So here we can visualize the first nine. We want to see maybe the first nine images from the sets. So we do import. Uh, let, me, let me go and run them so that The other one is delaying me. All right. Uh, so I spoke about now we are on visualization. So you can visualize um, some of the images from your training data set. You can visualize them. And then you will pass these data set to the model, right? Method for training in the, in the, so this is the data set that you have now is what you are going to now use for your training as well as testing. Then now you can configure the data set for performance. Okay. So sometimes some people do the auto tuning. Uh, the auto tuning uh, is a way you, by configuring your data set for performance, you make sure you use the prefetching and then you yield data from this without having any input output becoming a block. And then you can do the cache, which keeps the images in memory after they are loaded off the disk during the first epoch. And then you can do the prefetch, which overlaps the data pre-processing and model execution while training. So this is the auto-tune. Then you can create a standardized standardization of your data. As I said, if your data is in RGB, a colored format, then you, are, you know you are in the range of zero to 255. If it is black and white, then it's zero or one in a range of zero or one. And you standardize the data so that your data set is within a certain standard value. This is really important. So what you do is what we call rescaling. If your data is from uh, black and white, for instance, you can rescale it though from zero to 255, you can rescale it to zero to one. And then when you do that, you it means after you have developed your model, you run and everything, then you do again another rescaling to the colored port version again of it. So here you do the standardizing of the data, which is called a normalization. So you normalize the data to go from between zero and one. And then we know that there are two ways to use this. Uh, you can apply it to the data set by calling data set maps. And then, or you can include a layer inside your model itself. So sometimes people include the normalized data inside um, inside the, the definite the model itself. Okay, so now a model. 
sequential model. This is how uh, Keras, uh, and we are creating this model here. This is showing us. So this sequential model consists of three convolutionary blocks. I spoke about convolutionary neural network. So this is a good example. So we have three convolutionary blocks uh, with a max pooling layer. So when I spoke about convolutionary, uh, I, I'm sure you remember this one. Uh, can you see my screen? Can you see the, the convolutionary the network? So you see for, let me go and then click. All right, so you see for, for this one, oh, it's too blurred, my goodness. You have, you have here, let me annotate for you. You have here, you have here a max pool. You have also a max pool. You have a convolutional, you have a convolution, you have a convolution. You have a max pool, a max pool. Then you have fully connected, fully connected, right? So you have convolution, Max pool, convolution, max pool, full connected, full connected. This is the architecture we have, right? Example of a CNN, convolutional neural network architecture. So if we come here, oh. Ah. Okay, I'll try to show the CNN uh, bigger. Okay, is it better now? It's not it's showing, sir. Can you see ah, your screen, that, first? You can't, oh, oh, oh. No, I can't see. Is it better now? Yes. Yeah, it's yes, okay. Yeah. Good. So now you see we have a convolution, a max pooling, a convolution, another max pooling, a fully connected, a fully connected, but we have different kind of activation functions as well. Uh, unfortunately, I, did, I think I, I escaped uh, somewhere. I, sh I should have spoken about activation functions. So you have, in this sense, you have a convolution, a max pooling, convolution, Fully, fully connected with rectilinear, uh, rectilinear activation functions, and then a fully connected with just a neural network. So this is an example of a, a convolutional neural network, how it looks like. So if we go to the example that we are doing now, so what does it mean? It means that here, so here, the Keras sequential model consists of three convolutionary convolution blocks with a max pooling layer in each of them. And there's a fully connected layer with 128 inputs on top of it that is activated by a rectilinear um, activation function. And this model has not been tuned for high accuracy. So the goal is to show standard approach. So you see, now if you go, now we go to the model. We say sequential, this is the model, sequential. Layers, now 
we are adding the rescaling to our layer. Then now it starts. So have a look. First one is a convolution, then a max pooling, then a convolution, then a max pooling, then a convolution, a max pooling. Then now we create a fully connected, um, a fully connected layer as well. So if you read, if you read, just for you to understand what, how this is read, the, the sequential model consists of three convolution new blocks, three convolution blocks. Where are these blocks? Convolution, convolution, convolution. With a max pooling layer in each of them, max pooling, max pooling, max pooling, max pooling. Then there's a fully connected layer, fully connected layer. So this is the model. And I showed you a, a picture of how another one looks. This one, right? Convolution, max pooling, convolution, max pooling, fully connected, fully connected. This is another model. So this is how this model is written. Convolution, max pooling, convolution, max pooling, convolution, max pooling. Then a fully connected. Okay. Next. Next. Let's try to run. Next, we compile the model. For this tutorial, we choose optimizer. So one of the things I said, we need an optimizer. You need your data, you need your model, and then you need some optimizers. Popular optimizer is Adams the first of man, Adams, the Adam optimizer. So this Adam optimizer, and then we use, we use the Adam optimizer, as well as we use a loss function. And this loss function is the sparse categorical cross entropy loss function. So if you want to view, or if you want to see your training and your validation accuracy, you then can go here, you write your model, you have rather defined your model here. So now you say your model, compile, then use Adams optimizer. Then for my loss function, use a sparse categorical cost entropy. And then I choose a metrics, a metric that will be used for my loss function. Okay, thank you very much, Ethel. All right, model summary. So if you view all the layers of the network using your, you can then find some summary information about your new, your, your model, right? You view all the layers of your network using the model here, and then this you just do by model summary you'll be able to get. I think I should have probably used some GPUs. This one do not finish today. All right, but let's go on. Then you train the model. So you train the model for 10 epochs, right? And then with, with model fit method. So you take epochs 10, and then you say your model fits, train the data sets that we chose, validation data is val, da, val DS, and then your epochs, right? Of course, uh, maybe question is, what is an epoch and so on, but um, let's try to go on so we can move fast. But I'll tell you what an epoch is. So the epoch, means, um, let me just tell you now. The epoch is one 
Ah. One complete part, right, of the training data set. through your algorithms. So if you are doing your training, um, your, your, if your model, your, all your inputs go through your model once and it ends, then we know that that is one epoch. So if you say 10, then it does that for 10 times. It does, takes all the models through and then go take all the data through your model that you have, that you have chosen and then goes through this 10 times. So it will do this, this year. It will compile this 10 times. And then this is the epochs. You can visualize your results. So if you want to visualize your results, you create a history you're, because you have already have, you already have your model fits labeled as history. You can now go to history and determine the history accuracy, the validation accuracy, the loss, uh, loss of the history, validation loss, the epochs as well, the range. And then you can just print some images. You can print the email, the epoch range. You can print the plots, the validation accuracy as well. Uh, you can plot, you can visualize some, some of the pictures as well, and so on and so forth. Overfitting. In case there is something wrong with the model, right? In case maybe your plot shows that the training accuracy and validation accuracy of a large margins. Uh, still running, I'm still running. Okay, so the plot shows that the training accuracy and validation accuracy are off by large large margins and the models are achieved about 60% accuracy on the validation. So this means that uh, it's not good. Maybe there's something wrong with your data. You are getting 60% accuracy, accurate results. So uh, for the validation set, then it means that it's not, the model is not very good. So you want to check what has happened. So then in that sense, what you do is that, is that you go straight now. So let me check, let me just go here. So we say that there's a small number of training examples and then the model sometimes learns from the noise. So the person who asks, what if I do 20% is that you may get overfitting um, where there's a small number of training examples. And so the model sometimes will learn from the non or unwanted details from training examples to an extent that it negatively impacts the performance of the model on new examples. So this is what happens when you do a small, a small data set against uh, for testing and a larger data set for training. And then there are multiple ways to fight overfitting in the training process. In this tutorial, you will use data augmentation. Uh, what we, that's what we are going to do. So overfitting generally occurs when there are a small number of training examples. Data augmentation takes the approach of generating additional training data from your existing examples by augmenting them using random transformations that yield believable, lookable, looking images. So, you try to do data augmentation whenever you are overfitting. That's a small number of training data you have. So if you have such a problem, data augmentation helps you generate additional training data from existing examples by augmenting them using random transformation. So you just take some of your existing data, add some noise to them or that some uh, augmentation strategies to them, and then now create uses it as additional data for training. So to implement data augmentation, what you do to implement data augmentation is just to do a random flip, or you can also do random rotation, or you can do random zoom. And this 
can be added to your to your data. So you say data documentation, your sequential, and you say take some layers, do random flip horizontal, flip them horizontally, do random rotation, rotate them by 0 0.1 angle, or do random zoom, zoom in by 0 0.1. And this is what, uh, that's what, what happens, right? Then now you can visualize. So to visualize, we know you will use the math plot library. So you can do plot, figure, figure size that you want and how many images you want. So you say for images in the training data set, take for one to nine and then print or show these images for me. So once you have added your augmentation data, the data augmentation to your model, before the training in the next step, you have to add the data augmentation to your model before you train. Dropout, what do we mean by dropout? It's another technique for reducing overfitting. Where we introduce dropout. That is kind of regularization we introduce into your network. <clears throat> when you apply the dropout to a layer, it randomly, it randomly drops out by setting the activation to zero, a number of output units from the layer during the training. And this is how, what you do. You create a new neural network using this idea of the layers dropout before training using documented images. Next, you compile and you train again. So now you see we have here we did compile, model compile, then we saw that we had some overfitting problems. We created data augmentation. Then we did some dropouts. Then now we compile and train again. Then we do some model summary. Now we increase the epochs because we are increasing more data. So we can increase epochs, it's okay. Then we can visualize the set, the data again, the training results, and then, and then we visualize the training results. Then we can predict on new data sets, on seen data sets, and then use TensorFlow on some. So you can then immediately deploy this, for instance, on some mobile application or some device that then you can just uh, use for your work. Okay. So you can convert your model into like a mobile device or mobile app kind of work that then you can implement in your mobile application in a very simple way. All right. So let me try to go through finally the one that I'm running. Of course, I couldn't run this because I will never finish. Let me see if I will try something. Um, finally, finally. Um, so in this pneumonia case, you see again, very similar uh, libraries are needed. NumPy library, TensorFlow library. We need the Keras as well. From Keras, we need the layers. We also need Matplot library. And then, <clears throat> and then we need uh, also, um, we define some color parameters and then just unnecessary. This is the version of the TensorFlow we are using. It doesn't really matter. So here in this setting, let me let me see if I can zoom. Is it better? All right. So here from Google Colab, we import the drive. So the data is in my drive. If you go to my Google Drive, I go to my my drive here. You see that I have some I have something called data, right? I have this this here called data. And then in that data, I have my chest X-ray data, which is a zip file that I'm using. So I say, okay, import the import globe and then go mount, mount this zip file, right? Mount zip zip file and then unzip it into a new folder, right? Unzip this uh, file. So if you go there, you see that I have the zip file, which is now unzipped. And now just 
do a list. <coughs> Just do a list and see what is inside the chest x-ray folder. So if you go there, you see that you have chest x-ray, we have validation, we have train, and you have test. Then you can check how many how many images are in the, for instance, how many images are in the train, the training the folder. You can check it. You can check how many are uh, uh, of these images are labeled as pneumonia. You can check how many are labeled as normal. <clears throat> and then you can then work around these things. So these are just some data pre-processing uh, ideas, uh, just some data pre-processing stuff. And then you see that the data sets in the train are labeled normal and pneumonia. You can, you can fix the sizes of the image, do a batch size for them, and then do an image size as well. The number of classes, number of output classes that they are either zero or one or pneumonia and normal. Then now you create your data set, the train data set. So a similar example that we just saw, your train data set from Keras, pre-processing from the directory, you have your validation split, you have your you also have your validation uh, data set v, uh, val ds where you have your validation split 0.2 as well and then this also you can print some input information from this folder and next <clears throat> next you also then do some preprocesses on your tests so we have preprocessing on the train preprocessing on the validation and then preprocessing on the test data as well and once you do that, you can also check the class names, the way you see that they are also normal and pneumonia. For math plot, you can already plot some of the images. So in this case, I decided to plot some of the images. These are some of the images that I see. Um, level one is pneumonia, pneumonia, pneumonia. It also prints pneumonia, normal, pneumonia, pneumonia, normal, pneumonia. It prints some of the images for me to see if they are correctly uh, labeled as well. Then now you go again, because we are working from a Google Colab folder or file or Google Colab document uh, in our drive, you can go again and do some random imaging, random radiance, <clears throat> and then start some training labeling. So for the file, for files, we can create some file names. If they are normal in the file names, we give them, we append normal to them. If they are not, we append pneumonia to them. And then this helps us to label it as this, uh, exactly what you see, pneumonia normal, right? So we test, uh, we test labels as well, those in the, we do tests for test labels as well, where we check for those which are labeled as normal and then append normal to them as well as pneumonia, just for visualization and purposes. Now we go and import a uh, matplotlib, also import image. And then we can able to print some images as well, uh, not necessarily black and white, but try to give it a different color uh, and just for visualization purposes. So uh, we, we do this imaging plot just to visualize exactly what uh, we are seeing again here. Well, some examples of image visualizations that uh, in metrics. So metrics here, um, it's important because when it comes to health, health data, then your metrics are really important. Sometimes people say they use some um, F score. People use this F score approach where 
we are able to say true positive, false positive, true negative, right? True negative, false negative, and then some binary accuracy and precision and recalls as well as our metric. Again, you see here, we do data augmentation. When we do not have enough data, we can do data augmentation to increase the number of data. Here we do preprocessing random contrast, but we, are, we can also do random flip. We can do random rotate, random crop, random zoom, random translate. All these are preprocessing augmentation methods you can use for your data to create a new set of data for use. So in that setting, you can also plot and show some of these data sets as well again, where you have now done some pre-processing uh, of data augmentation to them. So auto-tune, we spoke about auto-tune again, where you do some caching uh, and then validating as well. So here we spoke about auto-tune. I want to see if the results here are Ah, good. This one is faster. I mean, I'm spending a lot of time waiting. All right. Well, let's go through briefly uh, this one, then we can go back to that again and see. So now we create the model. Um, where we are, we are using ImageNet. It's also another type of architecture. Uh, let me see this one. What model? So this is a very big. Uh, this is a simple convolutional neural network. Here we create a model. Uh, exceptions. You can freeze the model using the optim Adamus optimizer. We normalize the weights. Uh, we normalize the, the, the image between 0 to 2.5 to minus 1 to 1. Then we scale it. Then now we do some training as well as pooling, and then we do a dropout. We spoke about dropout as a regularization method. Then we, we apply some dense and an activation function of sigmoid activation function. And then we now do a model input and output. We compile again using the metrics that we have chosen. And then we return a model. So now we create a model and then we find a model summary. The model summary tells us that we have inputs, input layer, we have sequential, normalization, exception, global average pooling, global average pooling, dropout, and then a dense. So this is how the architecture looks like. It prints for us the architecture that we are using. So now we can plot the model uh, and save it. It's in the Google folder. I'll show you my, see my files. And then we can print the training as well. We can adjust the model for imbalance of data. Then we can, so this is the part that is still running. All right, so we can do some model checks uh, on when to stop. Then define, uh, we also plot the model in terms of the loss function and we also plot the loss. <coughs> Nothing. So unfortunately, the rest is not showing, so you cannot see what is what is happening. But if I go to my file, I want to go to my Google Colab for you to see.
So I already showed you uh, this example already. So we do the labeling. Then this is the data augmentation. The one that we have for data augmentation where we have done some zoom and some flips and stuff like that. And then this is also one for visualization. Okay. All right, so another example, uh, this one is, is, is better. Uh, it's faster as well, so I think this is better. So you do some importing libraries. <clears throat> Again, to set up example two, image classification. You set up your TensorFlow by importing some libraries. Then you download the data sets. So you download the data sets from Google API and then now onto your machine or into your system, your, your storage, <clears throat> and then you set a path for it. Then after you download, you can count the number of images there. Here you see we have 360 images. And then you can plot some of the images. So here we plot, for instance, we show, we visualize uh, some of the images. This is one for rows. Um, this is, uh, or this is, this is for what? This is for rows. And uh, this is also another one for rows. Um, some for tulips. This is for tulips. Um, this is also for tulips. And so on. And then next, you can create a data set. So your batch size, your image, uh, weight and height, you define. And then what you also do is you develop um, your now validation split where you have 80% to 20%. So this validation split here that you see validation split is 0 0.2, just means that you are doing 20%. And then you say, okay, this is for my training. This is my training subset. And then if you come to the VAL DS, you say that, okay, validation split is still 0 0.2. And this VAL DS is the subset of validation, is for validation. And now, so now what happens is that we, we can then print out um, the names, the class names in alphabetical order, it's always does. Then you can visualize some of these images. So if you import matplotlib, you can visualize some of these images. If you have roses, if you have dandelion, you have tulips, you have sunflowers or you have dandelions. You can visualize these images and see what really is happening there. You pass these data sets to the Keras model fit method for training later in this tutorial. So for image batch, labels batch in train, uh, you print the image batch shape. You can print it and you see the, the batch, the image batch shape as well. And then the image batch is a tensor of the shape uh, this is a batch of 32 images, uh, which is uh, shaped 180 by 180 by three, which is the, the last dimension refers to the RGB color. So it's a 180 by 180, which we created uh, when we created this batch here, here. We created this size 180 by 180. And then usually if it is this three here, shows that it is an RGB red, green, blue coloring. So we can configure the, the data set for performance. That's why we say that you use a data set cache, which keeps the images in memory after they are loaded off disk during the first epoch so that it doesn't go back and back and back. Or you do, and also you can do the data set prefetch, which overlaps the data pre-processing and model execution while training. So this you do by auto-tune and auto-tune means you now do uh, cache and then you do validation data set as well, cache. By standardizing what we said was, it means we are doing a normalization of the data. So we rescale it between from zero to 255 to zero to 111. All that means you divide by 255. Then you normalize the data set. This is train data set map. So you normalize it, image batch, labels batch, and first image and image batch zero. You print the first image and then the maximum image 
and you can include the layer inside your model definition, which can simplify deployment. So the first model we spoke about was we use a convolutional neural, a three, three convolutional neural, uh, convolutional um, blocks. And then we use three max pooling also blocks. Then we do one um, fully connected uh, block using the rectilinear um, activation function. So now you compile using Adams and then you can get your, again, the summary of your model. In this case, you see that we have convolutionary mass pooling, convolutionary mass pooling, convolutional mass pooling, flatten, and then dense to dense one, the number the outputs. Now you train the model. So if you train for 10 epochs, this is what you get. So you do one epoch, two epoch, three, four, up to 10. Then you can visualize your results. If you visualize your results, you see the training and validation accuracy. So you see that the training is going this way. The validation accuracy is somewhere here. If you do for another one, you see the training is going this way. The validation is also going somewhere else. This means that there is a problem of accuracy. And this means that there's a problem of accuracy. If you print this accuracy here, you get a 60% accurate of the model, which means that there's an overfitting so you create a data augmentation. The data augmentation, you can use random rotation, random zoom, random flip, so many and so many on. So we do a random flip on some of them, and then we do random rotates, and then random zoom as well. If you do that, then you can visualize few of these augmented data sets, right? So, this is one of them. You can see that it looks like it has been zoomed in. It looks like it has been flipped. Look, so you can actually see um, some of the differences. Then you add this now to your data set. Then you do a dropout. As you say, the dropout does reduce overfitting. So when you apply the dropout, it crops out a number of output units from the layer during the training process. Dropouts take a fractional number as input value, the form of 0 0.1, 0 0.2. So you do a dropout. And this means you are dropping 10%, 20% or 40% out. So now, so now we do, Data augmentation, which we spoke about, rescaling, convolutionary three, max pooling three, then we do a dropout, flatten, we introduce the dense, uh, the rectilinear for the fully connected now. So then you compile again, and this time around, when you compile and you increase your epochs a bit more, you can then plot again and see the behavior of your training and validation. So here you see your training and validation are almost in the same way, going in the same direction as well. And then it means that you can use your model now to predict um, future um, pictures, whether they are roses, tulips, and so on. And you can convert it into some app that people can use for learning and for playing around uh, machine learning projects. Okay, any question? I think this will be the end of my talk. Any question? Any question? So um, should I give within one exercise so that maybe you can try it and send me the results or you said to Kelvin and Kelvin will forward to me. Kelvin, is it possible? Yeah. 
Uh, please do do you do you or will you all be happy if I give you some assignments and then you also go, I mean just go through the TensorFlow example, change the data. I'll give you some data and then you you try to at least implement your first um, machine learning projects on your own. And then of course you send the results, we can we can look through it and then send you some feedback. No, no problem. Perfect. I they... Perfect. Yeah. So then I, I'll give you a small project, uh, some data, and then you try to go through the process again using your own data. So if you have your own data as well, you can use it, and then we can discuss it. If it's an interesting project, maybe we can create a, a good project out of it and then demonstrate it as well, so that others can learn from it. Um, uh, maybe just for, for interest sake, um, are we going to do the image one or we can do anything? Yes. Uh, no, uh, I, okay. I will do, we'll do the image one. Ah, okay, it's fine. Yeah, we'll do the image one. So I give you, we we'll get some images on some diseases and then we we'll try to do some classification for this. Ah, that will be good. Thank you. Perfect. All right, so in that sense, I say um, expect, uh, expect uh, an example, uh, uh, an exercise from me. Um, I'll send it to Kelvin, Kelvin will forward to all of you. And then maybe you can do it in groups. I don't know, you are, how many are you? You are 50. So if you do groups of four, or if you do groups of four, four, 12 to 13. Yeah, I, I, I think it's best if you do it in groups. All right. So please create groups of four. I, I want uh, to get. Uh, uh, is, is Kevin Kevin around? Kevin. Yes. I, I, I was thinking um, maybe creating the groups, you could check the time zones to ensure that it's easier for us to, to actually work together. Kevin, uh, so I think you should consider this. Huh? I can't hear you, Kevin. Okay, all right. So I think we'll create groups. Uh, Kevin will send a group list out, and then you can all discuss and try to implement your first some uh, machine learning uh, for some diseases or some other types of stuff. And then we, just so that you under, you learn from it, it's not complicated. All right, in that sense, um, thank you for participating in this lecture. Um, if you have any difficulties, uh, you can also send me an image or a, a message. Uh, if you are interested in building some other models for your personal, for some work you are doing in your company or your office, you can get in touch as well. We can work around it as well. All right, so apart from that, thank you very much for being here and all the best. I want to eat my, my snacks. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. We appreciate it.